So you start this morning on the first full-blown tutorial. Um, fortunately, it's not just me. It's a whole team here, mostly here with Tim Crone, uh, Joseph Gum, and Felipe Fernandez. You've heard from them in some way already. And uh, also, she may not know this, but Shell, you are now officially part of the team. Um, and we'll be talking about data access and um, well, broader, wonderful uh, universe of ocean data, or the ocean of data. And that includes, since it is the first tutorial, we'll start out with some um, basics on uh, the Python ecosystem, especially emphasizing visualization. Um, so uh, by noon, by the time you go to lunch, you will be able to work fluently with ocean data, both big and, and small, from a variety of sources, both local and remote, whatever you brought with you, um, well, whatever, but some subset of it, and a variety of formats. You'll be familiar with the different formats for data distribution and analysis, if I spell them correctly, and that includes uh, NetCDF. Hopefully, all of you have uh, heard of NetCDF before, but if not, no worries. You'll be hearing about it a lot uh, this week. Um, but even CSVs or just about anything under the sun. Uh, data comes in all shapes and sizes, um, and we need the ability, we all need the ability to be able to wrestle with data in multiple formats. Um, and the pros and cons of the performance, if you actually have a choice for how you store the data or transform the, the awful formats that you get from somewhere else and you need to transform it into a more robust and uh, efficient format, um, then you'll have some tools to do that. Um, will tell you, everyone but Joseph will say something about standards and conventions. Um, their role in the ocean data world, common ones, including, for example, the NetCDF data model and the format itself. Oh, you've heard of open data, and that is a very important community uh, standard for data access, CF conventions, uh, other metadata, and the cases where they come in handy. Um, not just uh, require, but can be. Um, and you will become familiar, if you are not already, um, with core Python packages that we believe are, are very useful to your day-to-day -day work at Wubi. Uh, you heard about some of those yesterday, uh, but some of the key ones that uh, to highlight are X-Array and Pandas, uh, obviously Math.lib, and I just almost go without saying, um, but also other more custom ones for the ocean, seawater, for example, to do some common transformations or pull out common uh, constants. Uh, the ocean core, you hear some of it from uh, Felipe. And uh, Rasterio, we deal with simple rasters, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, where can I find the ocean data? Of course, at least among the younger of you, the first answer is uh, Google, right? Well, it, it can be a good answer, um, and I emphasize the plain Google search, um, but that can be totally overwhelming and you can waste a lot of time if you start out very general. Um, I should have jumped to the third Google item, Google data set search. This is something that was unveiled about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, and uh, it's uh, looking very promising. Um, it's a tuned version of Google that specifically crawls and provides access to data sets that have been um, Flag in ways, in, in very specific ways. Um, give it a try. Uh, it, it probably worth your while. Um, Google Earth Engine is not quite a data source, but uh, for those of you especially who work with remote sensing, uh, we won't, I don't think we'll be touching on it uh, this week, but uh, those of you who work with a lot of remote sensing data, uh, it may be a good um, um, resource, except I'm just remembering, I copied this from a different hack week that was focused on land, and I'm just remembering that uh, traditionally it hasn't been very good for ocean data applications. Um, maybe that's changing. And uh, if you really want ocean data there, tell Google. Um, okay, hmm. let's cut up a bit. Um, the reality is that no single catalog, not even Google, will meet all your needs. So just um, that's just reality. Um, for discovery, search, convenient data access uh, in every single domain of marine research. Uh, we're not there yet. We, we won't be there tomorrow. Uh, Pangeo won't have everything on it tomorrow either. Um, so it's a, it can be a bit of a wild world. Um, 
your friends don't underestimate the value of your friends and colleagues. Uh, you have a diverse set of uh, colleagues um, in different subfields. They are more likely than you to know about have good authoritative sources of data or useful sources of data that can then point you to some of the other ones. Um, that's a link, and we'll provide this to you by the way um, later on. Yeah, Joseph provided this link from IOC, the uh, UNESCO IOC. Uh, it's called the Global and Regional Data Sources, and it's a compilation. I don't know exactly how they put it together, but basically it's a long list of uh, miscellaneous resources. Some would be the obvious ones, others seem probably kind of scattered, um, but it's also a good place to go find stuff. Um, I'm not going to even try to uh, list every single possibly important system, but um, there are international programs that are well known, such as WOS, JDOS, Argo, etc. Uh, in the US, and this is being cut off. Oh, I know what's going on. I think I know what's going on. In the US, we have uh, um, groups or sources like uh, NOAA and CI, which specializes in archiving of data. Um, some of the data that have been archived can be easy to use, not all of it. Um, but also, NCI produces great, some great um, data products that are such as the World Ocean Atlas and the World Ocean Database based on that collection of data. Nicodemo uh, also, and uh, Matt Bill, wherever it is, can tell you there it is. To tell you all about it. Um, also, there are systems that are linked to publications. When you publish your papers, as long as it's not a model, app, um, the uh, more and more uh, publications are requiring the deposition of data. Um, and some systems that are you may not be familiar with are Pangea and Drive, um, but also could be the linked to data on NCI, Wikipedia, etc. Pangea, um, however it's pronounced. Pangea.org, for those of you who are curious. <laughs> um, and then, I mean, one of the core sources of data is national agency monitoring. In the US, we have NOAA, of course, um, but it's not a monolithic, um, it's far from a monolithic agency. But so there's NDBC, NOS, high gauges, uh, CDIP, which is a quasi NOAA um, way GUI network. Um, acoustic data that NCI is collecting, and probably others that I'm missing also. There's the coastal um, component of, of um, NCI, the geophysical office, and so on. Uh, in Australia, I can think of IWAS. Um, that, that in Canada, uh, the one that comes to mind is that more it's from Environment Canada, and it's actually for Canadians among you. That I know it's actually Environment and Climate Change Canada. Just too long in it. Um, in Europe, there were probably too many uh, acronyms. Uh, the one that I was just remembering was Pixar 3. Um, and I did have a few others, like for biology, there's always an international in initiative with uh, national and regional nodes. Um, in the US, uh, internationally also, there's an MBON initiative. And uh, the, if you deal with animals and tagging, the um, animal tracking network. Um, Internationally, Canada hosts the Ocean Tracking Network and so on. So anyways, it would be impossible to list all of this, but uh, that's a starting point. Um, I held this two in particular to a separate slide, partly because um, we are specifically what well represented here uh, from OI and I use. Um, and also because for those of you who don't work with OI and I use, or maybe haven't even I've barely heard of it. The first question is, uh, are they the same thing? The acronyms are pretty similar. Uh, I, we get that all the time. So um, I probably won't do justice to each, but uh, OI is the Ocean Observatories Initiative. Um, it is an NSF-funded program that is sustained uh, as a long-term investment in infrastructure. Um, it has um, 
very specific footprints in where it has um, deployments and platforms. Mostly the US, but also some areas in other parts of the, of the world, um, three or four, I forget. Um, it, and it also includes um, the fantastic seabed cable observatory off the coast of Washington, so that way or whatever it is. And you'll hear more about that, the cable array. Um, and my understanding is that they try to, or they generally standardize some common hardware sensors and procedures across their entire uh, operations, uh, which is a pretty unique feature. Uh, I use um, it's the Integrated Ocean Observance System. It's a NOAA-led in, um, initiative that uh, it's really meant to be from the get-go, multi-federal agency, multi-partner, to bring, essentially to bring everyone together um, in some way who collects data on the ocean or does modeling. It's not um, limited to observations. It tries to leverage and enhance efforts that are already ongoing, um, in addition to providing funding for some new um, observing um, efforts. And it's really built as a network of uh, both multiple federal agencies, uh, regional components that are explicitly defined, for example, and the data management lead for managers here in the Pacific Northwest, but also what I use called systematic data assembly centers. For example, we'll hear about the glider DAC uh, data assembly center soon, and um, there are, or the HF radar DAC. I think Felipe will talk about that a bit. So this tutorial, um, this is the flow of the tutorial, and uh, sorry, it got broken up there. Um, I covered the introduction. Felipe will talk about uh, introduction to Matplotlib and mapping, so basic visualization. Um, that will be followed by more advanced visualization tomorrow. Um, and then a series of uh, what we call stories on data access, with using very specific types of data or sources of data. And each one of these will feature um, a different person. Um, but also uh, specific tools um, and again, specific sources of data. So hopefully when you put them all together, uh, that will give you a rich exposure to uh, common type of tools, common approaches, common frustrations too, um, and sources of data. This is cut off, so let's see. Well, you can't read that, or maybe I can do something. Just a second. Okay, so the first one will be on CTDs or death profiles featuring Joseph who works at a, um, with a group that does CCHDO that does um, that kind of stuff, that kind of data, day in and day out. Um, then we'll have a break. Um, and we'll be followed by OI stories that will divide it in two. One will uh, work with data on the cloud with Tim and another one will uh, get data from her data, uh, specifically Lido data. That will be followed by IUS um, on HF radar and something else that I don't know what it is, but that will be for I don't know what it is, just NHC is there, no worries. Ah, there you go. So you're going to really care about hurricanes out here. So I don't know the acronyms. Um, and then AUVs, uh, specifically Argo and um, uh, the glider DAC, the IS glider DAC, here's Philly. And graded data, even though my name is there, um, it's really mostly shell, um, at least the first one. Uh, I'll take credit for the second one. And we'll be uh, working with data from the NASA Kodak um, and a NOAA uh, Erda center or source of data. That's all I have. Of course.
All right. So now we're good. That's terrible. Can't really see anything in there, right? We should probably use another computer. Like, okay. It's not really. Yeah. Let me try one thing more. So if I'm still sharing on. So we use a URL on uh, our back channel. I told you, can you post from the data access to the general channel? And I want you to click on that URL. It should open you a bunch of instance with all four notebooks that we're going to be using the next step, right? And I'm going to try to do the same here so you can follow me. Are you on Slack here, YouTube? What? Like on Slack? I am on Slack. Okay, can I use your account to find yes. the URL? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's really hard to use a Mac. <laughs> yeah, please do it. I'm allergic to Macs, sorry. Where did it go? Everyone. This, right? Yes, that's the one. All right. Yeah. So there is some magic happen when you click that link. What it's going to do is going to give you a Panjou instance, but it's also going into our repository, our GitHub repository, where all the tutorials are, and it's trying to clone it for you automatically. Um, it's called Git Puller. It's an extension that's awesome for teaching, but it hides a lot of the complexity that we actually want to teach you. Later. So we're going to do that on the first day. But after today, we actually expect you to know how to do that community. And we're going to address that if I can plug my computer in. So why do we wait for OpenGU instance to spin up? Who here thinks Git is easy to understand? Who here thinks it's complex? Who here understood everything from yesterday's explanation about it? They're lying. <laughs> <laughs> it is very hard and it's fine to teach you. Right? It takes us a long time to understand it and to actually adopt it. Uh, the next version of it actually is improving a lot of the commands. So starting with 2.3.0, things are going to be a little bit better, more intuitive, but then we have to re relearn everything. Uh, did you all spin up our instance already? I'm the only one I didn't have. No, 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 no. Sorry? No, the machine type, I took the simplest one. I just picked the simplest one here. The link doesn't choose the machine for you. Uh -huh. 
So who here knows Matt Watley well? Well, who knows? Well. So on this table we have three. And in that case, if things happen in a way that other people need help, I'm actually going to ask you to spread and go help your kids. This is very basic math logic. So those people that raise their hands are probably going to be bored. Instead of going on Facebook or Instagram, etc., stand up, go to another table and help your kids. We just want to spread out math. It's up to you. I'm not going to ask you to actually do that. If you want to Facebook, that's fine. <laughs> Just pretend you're paying attention. I mean, you're pretty much improvisation now because, you know, technology is awesome. I use my computer and you say, it's fun. These people have fun for jokes, like, just come up here. And... No jokes. No bad jokes. Oh, I have one really, really bad joke about NumPy. Everybody here jokes NumPy, right? So you know the, the one about the guy that tried to import NumPy? And TSA said, Mod module not found. <laughs> Yeah, he was mad because he thought he was MP random select. <laughs> okay. That's bad, I know. That's it. That's the only Python joke they have? No, I have many Python jokes. Like, do you know why Python is better than C? Because it's a both C level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something is wrong. Yeah, it's like the same busy box place. Who's your work? Yeah, that's the feel. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Should we try to restart, Tim? Well, it worked a minute before on my very fast. Yeah, but you can everybody. Yeah. It's all right. Does anyone have any more jokes or puns? <laughs> well, bad jokes. <laughs> So, do you know that joke about the mathematicians that went to the bar? And the first one ordered a beer, the second one ordered a half a beer, the other one ordered a quarter of a beer, and then the bartender, you know, guys, you should really know your limits. <laughs> Yeah, I'm running out of jokes here. <laughs> so maybe I'll have that. Do we have one? Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> awesome. We have one for the audience. Two chemists walk into a bar. The first one says, I'll have an H2O. The second one says, I'll have an H2O too. You pass away shortly thereafter. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! We're in! Yeah, I'm an old guy. I use the old view. I don't use the lab. I'm sorry. And also because this is not my computer, it's not going to work on slide mode, and I'm not going to have the solution for the exercise. You have rice? Okay. But I don't, oh, I'm on Geo. I'm not on your computer. So it doesn't work. No big deal. Like, I had all this slide show presentation prepared and I had a lot of exercises uh, with the solutions. We're not going to do any of that. So we're improvised right now. So learning objectives. I actually want you to learn and understand how a finger on MathWatchLit works. Why do we teach you MathWatchLit? Uh, pretty much there is all this package out there, uh, and this picture from Jake Vanderpa tries to summarize all that. And you have these families of interactive plots, static plots, 
JavaScript page or OpenGL page. But to be honest, at the heart of all those is my project. Even those are kind of just connected, got inspired by my project or something. So you have to learn MyPotlib to go to the next level. However, MyPotlib is hard for two reasons. One, it inherited a lot of MATLAB-like syntax because it tried to make the way the migration easier. And second, because it's an imperative kind of way uh, of body. You tell it what to do, plot dots on blue color, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So usually your plots have many lines of code. The new ones, they have a declarative way of plotting. Who here is familiar with strategic plot from R? Put your hands, yeah, it's more like that way. Like you actually tell what you want and the plot will be generated. What are the advantages of each? One is more customizable. You can make it really fancy and nice to my plot it. The other one is quicker, but kind of hard to customize. And your data needs to be prepared for that. We're gonna see both approaches here. So this is the anatomy of a matplotlib figure. I'm not gonna go over all that. This is uh, from their own tutorial. So you have plots, markers, tick markers, files, lessons, and all that. And everything is summarizable. And now I'm gonna sit down. I hate to do this kind of thing sitting down because people don't really see me. But I want you to follow along. Everybody got their apprentice with this, right? Nobody's waiting anymore, okay. So first thing first, we have to use that magic, the percent metabolism in mind when you're on notebook. Yes. Can I do that, Jun? Command plus. Is that better? And also, you should be able to open this notebook uh, open here. You. Yeah, you should follow along. Yeah. Um, it's in the folder. Um, what is it? <laughs> this should help as well. Yeah. How can I make it full screen, Ujung? Here? Okay. All right, is that better? All right, so on the notebook, we have to do the percent uh, method of the inline to get the figure, the PNG figure inline of the notebook. However, if you're doing interactive stuff, you might use another backhand. So you can try this later. No one should try right now. We have the backhand, TK uh, backhand. And there's also a notebook interactive that's from the notebook backend, which will give you an interactive figure here. Okay. However, the line is probably the best one to save and share notebooks because it's just going to be a plain PNG figure. The other ones will either pop up a window or you have an interactive figure that will last as long as the kernel is active. Mind that every time you change the backend, you need to restart your kernel. Okay. If I say something that doesn't make sense, like kernel, cell, or notebook, raise your hands and ask. So when you say if you change the background, you can change like what we're looking at. Yeah, instead of in line, if I have QT5, I have to restart the back. Okay. And then I have actual QT windows. It should be pronounced cute, but nobody said that. So it's end up saying QT because it makes cute graphics. Notebook. Yeah. So if you can try that, uh, restart your kernel and try notebook. Okay. So a very basic figure. Um, sorry. Before I go, I forgot. We have some uh, convention support. If you're a diehard Python programmer, what we do, we sign this. They, they say that this is wrong. Like renaming a module is wrong. They don't like that. But it's common in our world. Right, so you're going to sell out of that. Just don't abuse it. So, so we have a few scenarios for NumPy, we import NP, that was my joke by the way. Uh, Matchplotlib, we import PLT, and there are others. But if you find a new library and try to be polite with our fellow programmers and try to import either the whole model, like from Matchplotlib import Python, 
or is it short in four metaphors? Okay. But it's fine to break the standards for data science and stuff. You're going to see NPL everywhere. Just don't invent something different. Like you can't rename that. I can report my property as my name. That's not clear, right? It's horrible code. Don't do that. So this is just to inspect the backend that we're using. So we're using the line one. If you change, you should get something different there. And let's go to our first figure. So the figure object doesn't do anything. It's just initialize the figure, right? And that's the repo for the figure. Repo is just uh, how the Python object is shown on the screen. It's more actually, but we don't really have to explain all of that right now. So figure alone doesn't do anything. We need to add some access. And with access, you actually have something, right? This is a blank access from zero to one. It's the default. But we don't want to create a figure and an access all the time when we're working with Matplotlib. We actually want to create them in one go. So Matplotlib has the subplots. Who here used it before? Awesome. So you're all pros, so you don't really have to do this tutorial. So you can create both the figure and the access in one go. Okay? And you can customize it. Like if you need subplots, you can put it number of columns and number of rows and actually the size of the picture. In this case, because I want them to have the square shape, I just double the width so I can have them with the same width and height. And let's do some actual data, right? So I have this uh, data from some buoys back in Brazil. And I'm going to use pandas to read it. Uh, who here used pandas before? Awesome, this problem is great. You never really have to teach this. So there are some tricks to pandas to actually get your data cleaned at low time. And one of the tricks that I'm using, I'm declaring an index column. I'm telling to parse the dates. And I'm telling what value you should skip as not a number. Or this is actually a little bit hard with pandas. <laughs> And just break what not a number really means. Not a number is an I to believe float. And any operation of not a number is not a number. Not a number is not equal to not a number. And this not a number is actually NA, not available. It's a mask. Like we copied this from the R word. So this may be confusing for people that are using pandas for some computation stuff. Be aware. They actually have an integer, not a number. It doesn't really exist. Not a number is a float. So let's load that data, and we're loading straight from the, uh, the web. We have this URL with it. And now I'm going to do some cleanup. So this cleanup is not uh, very conventional. So what I'm doing there, I'm accessing the columns, and I'm using a string uh, operation there to actually name my columns in order by passing zeros. So my columns here were like one, 10, 30, and I'm actually padding for 0, 0, 1, 0, 10, 0, 30, okay? So I have them in a numeric order. That's pretty much the only thing that I'm doing here. And I'm splitting uh, a letter that I had at the beginning. I could use plus T on the score 1, T on the score 20, T on the score 500. So how about showing what it looks like? I am going to show, but the problem is because I have to hold the microphone get up and I, I So I, I'm explaining first and I'm showing later. So let's execute that. Yeah, we really needed the other microphone or the podium. So you see it's strings with uh, T1, T2, and etc. And after we do this, we actually have numeric columns, okay? And as you can see, because I told you to parse the dates, we actually have an index color with parse dates that has a mean dependence. That's a Python object. I can do actual date operation in there. So let's create our first plot. And here, I'm using the trick of converting that column string to a float, so I can actually have a z-axis. And that's our first plot. It's just a profile from that data, right? It's a temperature data. You can see like uh, it's a layer, and you can see the thermocline and all that. But what we can do better in that figure? We can add labels. 
right? So here I added a few labels, and I'm going to stop here for a moment. Who here doesn't understand how we're labeling this figure? So pretty much everybody's familiar with that. Just want to know if I can skip this part or. So, you know, we can use uh, Unicode, we can use WAPEC code. All you have to do is declare a raw screen for that, and then you have Unicode mixed with WAPEC code. Um, there is one thing that we're doing there. That's not nice. We are telling that the that is a negative, right? And we like it to be positive. But I did that on purpose to have it uh, in the right order. Is there a better way to do that? Does anyone know? Invert the axis. Invert the axis. Great. Let's, so let's do that. So this is not inverted. So that's better, right? Sorry, I'm so slow. I'm typing on a Mac, and the Mac doesn't like me. So that's way better. Does everybody do this already? Am I preaching to the choir here? Or? Okay, we can also customize the ticks. So instead of having, uh, oh, sorry, here we go. Of having it be automatic, I can change. I want it to be zero, 100, 400, 600. And the tick customization can also customize the tick label. So not only the actual ticks. So instead of having numbers, if I'm creating a figure for a class, you know, for a lecture, I can put that surface in clear in general mindset. Right? You can put symbols from wherever you want. Oops. Sorry. Because I'm not on my computer, so I don't have this. Well, here's one exercise, um, and it's a mix of pandas and Matplotlib. I want you to create a plot that instead of uh, being that plot, it's going to be a time series, right? So you have to choose an index, and you have to plot it. I'm going to give you, what, three minutes to do that. If you can do it very easily, just put your blue sticker. If you're having difficult, use your orange sticker. And in three minutes, I'm going to do it my way, and we're going to compare what we did here. Right? Go for it. So it's not really what it says there. I don't want you to do that plot and customize it because you all know how to do that. I want you to plot a time series instead of that plot. Okay? Just because it seems that everybody knows how to customize their plots. So I'm going to skip ahead. Emilio, you're taking care of the time. I found this on that one. Do you think the podium will work better? Then you can stand. Oh, yeah, that's better. Okay, great. Yeah. Let's do this. Because we're doing exercise, right? Yeah. Okay. 
Well, all, all the exercises we're gonna have that problem, right? But it's yeah. very can do this. Let's do this. I'll move that here yeah. and we can plug it. Okay. To be this window, right? Yes. Nope. Uh, this one. No, the first one is desktop, so it'll just show. Oh, okay. The first one is everything. Yeah. Cool. All right. And how do I get back to the <laughs> my um, own? Yes. Aha. You're there. Yeah. Oh yeah, that makes yeah, that works. If you can hear me, right? Oh, okay. Who got similar plot? Not exactly this one, but something similar. Yes. <laughs> Maybe two. So it can follow the middle. Two, yeah. two. Well, I have something there. Okay, does that work? Is my voice going to the microphone? All right, so who here actually use labels to find the proper depth instead of using indexes? When I use iLock, I'm using indexes, right? So I'm getting all the rows from the last column. Who here did that different using labels? Great, you're pros. Because you should never use what I'm doing here. You actually have never. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> okay, that's fair. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. So we can actually use labels, right, to, to do that. And then our code is more readable instead of using indexes. If you're coming from MATLAB, using indexes is natural. But on the Python world, it is frowned upon. Also, who here started a Metaplotlib figure instead of just using the dot plot? That's perfectly fine, especially if you're going to customize it a bit more. But Pandas has a plotting scheme that is semi-declarative. It's not completely declarative, right? So I can use, and what is creating is a Metaplotlib figure. I can do this if I want to customize it. It's returning an axis. So I can have my axis object here, right? And I could customize it, add labels, change the labels. The main advantage of using pandas to plot is that I get for free an interpretation of the dates. And I get for free uh, a figure that kind of makes sense within the data frame. If you do this, Actually, you have the help of everything that you can do or with the pandas data frame. And we can be even more declarative. We can say X and Y, what you want them to be. So I can say here that I want, for example, X to be the first temperature series and Y to be, I don't think this works. I don't think we can actually say to get the index. Let's try. Yeah, it doesn't work. But I can't say to use everything else, but that's very confusing, right? And if I just don't declare anything, it plots everything against the axis. Sorry, the indexes. So I have here all the profiles against the indexes. And even got me a legend for free, but the legend is not very readable. So plotting direct from pandas can be easier. Yep. I lost the mic. Hello. Well, I guess it's off. We need battery. 
the bottom uh, no it's batteries i guess we need batteries hello oh it's back yeah but it's low battery it's not gonna last all right Do, can you hear me or the mic is unnecessary for the streaming it sounds great sounds great okay so some customizations when you do the pandas plotting uh, the legend goes wherever it fits we don't want that we want it to go in a place where you can actually read it so you can customize the location of the legend we can add grids and we can change the figure size but if you notice i'm actually mixing now the pandas plot and the access object that we turn who here knew this already knew that you can plot with pandas and customize the plot no problem so pretty much every new uh, data model objects pandas x-ray aris they have a plotting mechanism and you can plot not only with matplotlib you can plot with other packages as well so like i said we should try to be um, more declarative so now i'm plotting with a label so what i'm plotting there is not only the, it's not it's no longer the first index of columns or row what I'm plotting is the column named 001, which surface. It's one meter below the surface. Is that better? Okay. So it's way, way more declarative. You know what I'm plotting by just reading the code. I don't need a comment saying, hey, I'm plotting the surface. You can read the code and you can see, hey, it's plotting the surface. It's plotting one meter, right? And also the way I'm constructing the customization of the figure is a more readable way. I'm using the long names. People coming from MATLAB are tempted to use M instead of marker, like LN for line style instead of writing line style. And all these kind of things that I'm using there, it's harder to type, but it's easier to read later. So when do you choose like plotting something like dot OB, it's gonna be like a point and a zero in a, a blue dot, basically, versus writing marker blue, marker type zero, whatever. So when do you choose one or the other? It's pretty simple. When you're creating a figure you interact with and you're just playing with, use the short version. When you're finalizing your script and you're gonna share, use the long version. And remember, tab is your best friend. Autocomplete works everywhere. So typing a long command is no, it's not that hard, right? As you can see, because you're all pros, I'm skipping and I'm kind of teaching best practice instead of teaching matplotlib because you know how to use matplotlib. Question. Who here understand what's going on here? Raise your hand. All right. You raise your hand or just put in your code? I'll buy a beer for the person that can explain it that, or coffee, or chocolate milk, whatever you drink. No one? So there are gaps in this time series. There are small gaps and big gaps. The small gaps we can't even see right, because we're not zooming in. The big gap we can, that's when the, this buoy was under maintenance. And I want to interpolate the small gaps because we're just a few minutes, but I do not want to interpolate the big gaps. Pandas know about dates, knows about time series. So when I ask it to interpolate using time as a method, I can put a limit. I'm only interpolate gaps that are 10 minutes because my index is in minutes. This is very useful. Anyone try to do this on MATLAB? <laughs> it'll, no, I'm not kidding. It will be about 100 lines of code to do that. And I just did with two lines of code because I separated the options. If I actually hard code the options in there, it's going to be one line of code. And this is what happens if you don't, if you just interpolate. Connect, right? We don't want that. We actually wanted to know about the time frequency interpolate within that frequency. Who well, here learned something new? Awesome, that's why we're here. So here's an exercise. Use the soup plots and create two plots with the time series on a row. Right, three minutes, that's enough. I can 
top whenever, and I can I can keep up the pace on the other one. The other one, please. The other the ten ten minutes if I just show if I don't do the exercises. No, let, let's do it. Uh, some yeah. of them like um, um, in KUB will be quick. I know I can that. Yeah. And I'm gonna skip because they know they seem to be very knowledgeable in this work. There's always a challenge that it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not people. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, I'm seeing some blue stickers, which means that some people are done. Uh, it's fine to copy what I'm doing there. I'm just going to explain it. You don't have to stop. And if you did something different, it's great because then we can compare notes and understand the differences. So first thing, I kind of mix pandas plotting with metric plotting, right? I created my figure because I want two axes on the same figure. Who here knows about share X? and use that before. Great, if you're plotting time series or any other property that have a shared X, you should always use it. Not only because you get the data properly aligned, but if you are using interactive metaplotlib, when you zoom on one, it zooms on the other as well. I also have share Y, but I did not use share Y here because I'm plotting surface and 500 meters, and the scales are quite different. So I wanted to auto scale. So if I actually tried share Y, which is fair depending on the data and depending on what you're doing, here's what would happen. You pretty much can't see uh, the variability on the at depth, right? So when I create the axis, then I can tell pandas to use that axis. And this is what I'm doing here. And because pandas, let me remove this line for a moment. Um, it just adds a the name of the index as the label, and I don't want that. Time, you don't need to describe time, and this was also in Portuguese, so that doesn't mean anything to you. We can add an empty label to make a better figure. 
right? That's another trick. All these notebooks are shared with you later. Don't worry, and I'm actually gonna skip a few of the exercise, but I highly recommend you to go there and try them. And if you have trouble, find us later during the help desk hours in the afternoon. I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit because of the AV problems that we have. This exercise here, I actually highly recommend you try because it's not only a plotting exercise, but it's also reading a horrible data in a horrible format, which is real life example. Sorry. Just a clarification, you said there were a couple of problems. All the uh, uh, cells that have to load, no, okay. yes. those will not run, right? Those will not run for you now, because those are the solution. They will run for you after the tutorial, because I'm gonna push the solutions to the repository, right? What I just recommend is that you skip them or comment them out. Yeah, just don't try to run them. Yeah. Even I don't have them here because I was not able to use my laptop. So I'm pretty much coming up with the solution from the top of my head, which you should never do. So I'm gonna skip that one, and I'm gonna straight for slices and surface because we have some modeling people here, and this is kind of important. So I'm gonna load uh, Ron's model using X-ray, straight up from, oops, sorry, from an opened up server. <laughs> So you see that was very fast. It's not only because we are on Pangeo, but also because opened up servers are lazy. It only loads the metadata. It didn't actually load the data. So now I want to find the sea surface temperature. X-ray has this wonderful method that's called filter by attributes. And I can actually give you a standard name, a standard CF name, the Climate and Forecast Convention, and I can find a variable. So if I don't know anything about this model, but I know about CF, I can still navigate the data set. So let's see if I can find the temperature. There you go, found the temperature. So it returned me a data set with that temperature and all the coordinates and all the units and everything in it. Now X-Array is Pandas uh, for multiple dimensions. So we can do pretty much everything that we did with Pandas. The Pandas I lock, the index, index chain in X-Array is called I cell. I selection, I guess, uh, but it's a little bit better than pandas because I can actually use the names of the dimensions and use indexes. So I'm getting the first, actually the last time there, so it's the last time run, and I'm getting uh, the last sigma rho, which for those who are familiar with from, that's the surface, that's not the bottom, right? And then I can actually create a plot surface. And you see, I named my variable surface to make that clear that I'm getting the surface. So I'm supplementing a deficient of not knowing what minus one means by naming my variables property. Good practice. Your variable names should be meaningful. So now I'm gonna do a plot using X-Array that uses Matplotlib, so it's layer on top of layer of abstractions. And I'm just declaring that my X is long row and my Y is lat row. For those who are familiar with from, that makes sense. For those who are not familiar with fronts, it's pretty much the latitude and longitude for the row variables. Temperature is a row variable. And there you go, we have a plot. And the funny thing is, this plot knows about uh, ge geographical coordinates. So it's not only a matplotlib plot, it's actually a cartopi plot that uses matplotlib. Who here heard about cartopi before? Awesome. So cartopi is used to make maps, and X-ray just did that for us. Let me do something here. Oh, the next cell does it. So we can actually do uh, the cart. The, uh, we can actually do some customizations there. One of the customizations that I'm going to do here, I'm going to change the projection, and I'm going to create my own cartopi axis because I want to add coastlines. I'm gonna run this again because the first time I run, it downloads the coastline data, so we have that warning over there. Now, because I have the data, if I run it again, I don't have the warning, just to clean it up. So the main difference here, I changed the color map, I imported Cartopi, and I declared a projection. And then I saved the axis from that projection, and now I have the Cartopi axis which is a little bit different than the matplotlib axis. It actually it's augmented, it has more methods. And one of the methods is coastline. So I pretty much mix here X-ray, matplotlib, and cartopi in just a few lines of code. Very confusing, right? But at the same time, very convenient once you master it. And who here knows about CMotion? 
awesome, a few people know about it. For those who don't know about it, it's a collection of color maps for ocean sciences. They have a collection for, you wanna ask something or just? So it's a collection for ocean sciences that has temperature, salinity, um, turbidity, and all these biology and physical uh, quantities. It's the, um, I've never used CMO like this. Is this because that map is not available? They're usually just no, they're all available. And this is, I did this on purpose. You can use CMotion as a standalone library, like this, or you can use Pellet Table, which brings a lot of other color maps. So if you are not only in ocean science, but if you're doing something different, there is a lot of really nice color maps on Pellet Table. It's just another layer of abstraction. Who here heard about those uh, computer science videos from PBS? They are really cool, and the presenter keeps uh, using this elevator to go to another level of abstraction every, every video. There's about like 40 videos. It's awesome, you should watch it, it's like 10 minutes each one. But every time you move another layer of abstraction, they have this animation of the, the, she getting in the elevator and going to the next level. Like what we do is this, it's layer on top of layer on top of layer. How are we on time? Ah, moving. Okay. So I'm gonna do a vertical section. And I'm also going to use X-ray here. And pretty much what I did here is um, I load my data. It's from Hycon. I selected salinity, I select the time, and I select a specific longitude and a method of interpolation. Now, section ploy, plots. I actually had something on my slides that I don't have here. They're not easy. This one works because it's Hycon, and Hycon it's Z, 1D coordinates. It's very easy, right? But if, if this was a sigma kind of model with the non-dimensional vertical coordinate and 2D coordinates like ROMs, where you have actually two points for each lateral on a curvilinear grid, this is really hard. There is a way to do it. Uh, I have many examples on how to do it here and here. Take a look at it or ask questions later, but I'm not really going to teach this. Uh, I'm not going to run the last cell here because it's not going to work because I don't have the data. It was on my computer only, but I'll definitely push this to the GitHub so you can use later. But pretty much what we're doing here is the same pandas plot, but instead of using matplotlib, we are using uh, HV plot. Actually, I can adapt. Let's see. We'll probably do this. It should work. HV plot is going to be, we're going to see more about it tomorrow. It creates interactive graphs with uh, hover tools. We can actually zoom in, pan, zoom out, and they have a JavaScript backend, a backend and they use bokeh uh, underneath. So again, lots and lots of layers. But all you have to remember, if you want a static plot, use dot plot. If you want an interactive plot, use HV plot. Okay, that's what I had for MATLAB. Sorry for the AVP problems. I promise we're gonna to try to do better next time. Uh, should I go to the mapping or should I just skip it? Um, okay. You can uh, do it somewhat quick. Yes. So there is a second notebook that I'm gonna ask you to load. It's the base map in Cartopy. We're gonna do it very quickly. So who here still uses base map? All right, I have a slide for you. <laughs> So pretty much I'm gonna load the data, some data here. It's the Challenger path data, which is a really nice data, and I'm gonna plot it using Curto, using base map, sorry. This is a fast map, there are a lot of customizations there. I'm gonna let you extend it as an exercise for you to read it later. But as you can see, there's something wrong with that map, right? Something's happening at the date line. Lines are connected the way they should not be. So the reason for that is you should not use base map. Base map has an end of life announced it already. It's, maintained for, it's not maintained for years. It's just uh, some bug fixes and it's gonna die in 2020 together with Python 2.7. So move away from base map as soon as possible and start using Curtopy. And also, if you're using Curtopy, that plot actually works the way it should because Curtopy knows about projections, knows about the date line. So it's the same plot but correct, okay? You don't have to actually deal with all this state line problems if you're doing global maps. And here's another example of 
how Cartopy deals with that. You can use the plate carry, which is uh, pretty much unprojected, or you can use the geodetic, which is the projected way of doing things. So it connected the dots the way it should. I'm gonna skip this exercise and this thing in the interest of time. I'm just gonna show some more customizations that we can do, like in a kinetic customize the tick labels, put them where I want. Cartopy has a lot of data kind of built in or search for the data. Uh, it searches from natural earth resources and has this stock image that's pretty cool. It has ocean and land. So we can make very simple, beautiful maps with just few commands. Um, I have some exercise on customize that, but uh, again, I'm gonna leave that as exercise for later. Just gonna run whatever I have here. Okay, one of the resources is natural earth. And natural earth has political boundaries, um, rivers, lakes, uh, coastlines. It does not have topography. So if you need topography, you actually need to read from another data source. And you can do fancy things like getting an image. This was a PNG. And we georeference the image in a very hack way. And then we can plot things on top of the image, right? So these stars here are a cruise that we did crossing that eddy. And people want to see that on top of that image that we have. It reads shape files as well. This is a shape file from GSHHS. It's another built-in feature on Cartopy. And Cartopy has one main advantage uh, when compared to base map. As you can see, it's taken a while for that cell to run because it's downloaded the data on the fly. Base map is huge, it's almost uh, 120 megabytes. So if you live in a country like mine, getting installing base map is really hard. But Cartopy is lightweight and it only downloads the data that you are requesting at uh, when you request it. So makes things like this easier. In this case, it's taking too long because I on purpose asked for the full resolution. That's why it's taking too long. But it caches the data. So it only takes long the first time. The second time is gonna be very quick. And I run out of things to say while we wait. I was really hoping the Pangeo was gonna be faster and this was gonna be done before I end my explanation. Yeah. Okay, so you should not use this stock image instead. You you have a different image. There are, there are different, there are images with only land and only ocean. You should probably use the one with only land or vice versa, depending on, on, on what you have. Or you should color your lands. You can also do that instead of having them be transparent, have them be red, right? There, you, that's possible as well. Okay, so I asked for the GSHS uh, shape file. And as you can see, this is a very complex bay with a lot of features and looks nice, right? Looks great. But if you live there, you're pretty pissed because it's missing a lot of detail, like it's missing a big river that exists here. This is the problem with global data sets. So sometimes you need to read local data that you collect yourself. And we can mix Cartopy with GeoPandas for that. And here I'm gonna read a shape file from the same region that I have here. Who here knows about GeoPandas? Just a few. Those who don't, you should definitely look into it. Makes your life way, way easier when read, reading shape files and GeoJSON and stuff. So I just read that shape file. I'm gonna select the geometry and I'm gonna plot that on Cartopy. As you can see, now I have the river in there, right? Because this is local data, someone actually collected data. And uh, who here had this trouble before with global data? Yeah, it, you're probably trying to use non-US regions, right? Because in the US, GSHS works great. It's only outside of the US that things get complicated. But as you can see, this doesn't do, right? Like people want to actually plot samples, uh, there are sample locations here on the river and it was going to show them on the land. That's just wrong. We can reproject the data and I'm going to do a very simple example here where we had the WGS84 uh, for this region. So this is the UTM. We can use PyProj and convert that to light long. And then we can plot on Cartopy, but here I'm doing both. I did the pipe project projection, and I'm also doing the reprojection using the Cartopy built-in feature for that. 
just to show that they match. So you don't really need an external library. And that, as you can see here, they match. They're all in the same position, right? So this is the Cartopay way of doing it. And it's very similar to a project string. So here's familiar with project strings. Just immediately. That's actually the fact, oh, and child, the fact that you don't know it's great because project strings are hard and annoying. So you don't need to dig deep into that. Use the higher level interface. Use Cartopay or PyProj. So all you have to do is to declare a globe, a datum, this, the UTM zone, uh, UTMs by default, North M series. So if from the South M series, you have to declare that as well. And there you go. It's converted. All right. Any questions? Um, if you start up a little bit, like when you're, I don't know much about Cartopy, but like when you're creating your configure and acting object, mm -hmm. it's already in the Cartopy. It's already like the Cartopy. Object. Yes. So how would you do, how would you go about having a subplot where one of the subplots needs to be an abstraction, but the other one is like a random? You have to use plt.axis for each subplot and declare a different projection on each subplot. You can't do together. Like when I do this, I'm using this function make map, right? I actually forgot to say this, so it's nice that I go back here and show it. When I created the make map. I'm kind of reusing it a lot. You probably noticed that I'm reusing for different maps. You should try to do this as much as possible. Create functions, right, that will help you. Um, I, I lost the cell where I did it. Create functions that you can reuse. Like this one. So because I can only declare one projection for each axis, if you're doing multiple axes, uh, you need to create plt.axis projection one, plt.axis projection two, and then join them on subplot. All right. So, is there any way that we can save the final plot So, for example, for roles, you would normally need to have a host line, right? Yes. And like, I can definitely use that as a post line and like that to interpolate my data and use that as a. Oh, you, you want to get the lat long for, for the coastline data? Yeah. It's possible. I, it's definitely possible. Or, well, on a shape file, it's way easier, right? Because you actually have lat longs in there. Um, the natural earth is a shape file, but you can actually hack the axis and get that. I have a notebook on that on my extras. I'll show you later. Um, yes. Well, you, ha you have to change your projection, right? You need to change your right, choose the right projection for your plot. Uh, I always have uh, a problem because, like, uh, we have three axes. Uh, the lat long data is not very strict, like in the regular lat long data. Uh, we have a uh, lat increasing up to some point and it skips. And then uh, both lat three and long three are matching. Mm -hmm. Because it's there is an example of that in the Cartopi gallery. Um, I didn't show, but I have some links here for galleries from our resources. And like the Orca models like that, if I'm not mistaken. So they have an example for the Orca model and they show how to do that. But yeah, it's not trivial. Do you want to start setting up or still get questions? Because we are going to go on break right now. So there's a break. Um, 10 to 15 minutes and then in the meantime, Joseph will awesome. set up. Joseph, do you want to use do you set up or you want to put yours? Okay. So I just sit come back, be ready at 45. And I'm free to answer questions now or later, whenever you want. And sorry for the AV problems. All right, moving to their seats. We will be starting the data access 
talks shortly, and I will be leading off with working with CTD data. Okay, so this is data access, uh, working with CTD data. Uh, since you don't, most people get data from CCHDO by going directly through the website, I figured I would be a little bit remiss to talk about data access and showing you how to plot the data if you don't know how to get it. So, uh, this is the website. It's very plain. You can kind of click around. There's a little thing that shows you the different lines of all the cruises that I've ever been on and spend way too much time at sea for. Not every single one. I've probably been on a quarter of the ones that are assigned for every um, 10 years. Yes, a little bit bigger. Uh, so if you are interested in working with CTD data um, or data from cruises and you don't know how to get it, you would come to cchdo.ucsd.edu. We have these bottle files. We have our older CSV file. We also have an even older net CDF file. That is going to change soon, but uh, it's not ready quite yet. Anyway, if you have any questions about how does it work, uh, we will be at the help desk. People will be at the help desk every day from Tuesday till Friday, although you'll be presenting on Friday, so I guess that's not really helpful. Uh, but if you have any questions about any of the tutorials, about plotting, about data access, machine learning, anything, the instructors will be around, just come and talk to one of us. More than happy to help you with your problems. Anyway, uh, there are, there's a notebook in the data access directory that says CTD cast good. That's a good CTD cast. If I can add something, um, you're seeing the list of notebooks, there's also one called index, uh, and that may be an easier guide. That'll take yes. directly to um, the individual notebooks to the right sequence. So, what we're doing in this notebook is first loading the data. Uh, and feel free to just um, follow along, um, press enter. There aren't really examples to work through. Yes? No, right now, for the purpose of the tutorial, the data has been loaded in the repository. So when you use the link that we all sent you to click on, that pulled the data just for this tutorial. So if you wanted to use data from, if you wanted to use other data, you'd have to go to the website and grab it first. Is there a way to Not yet. <laughs> It's coming, but not yet. Uh, so we use Pathlib first to load the data, and then we are using uh, Felipe's Pi CTD library to kind of work with the data. It's one of the, it's certainly more simple than my library. So it's much better for showing. And as we run through it, it is now eating through the million rows or something, and it'll eventually show us what the beginning of the file looks like. And we can look at it, and we see that it's a data frame that's been loaded in Pandas. So there's a little plot there. And that's showing us the temperature and the conductivity in the cast. 
And yes, adjustments. Anyway, this cast works just fine. So the other one is much more interesting. It's showing that um, we're doing some smoothing in the data. There is jitter. So this is kind of proving that the methods actually do work inside of the library. If we continue to go down, I'm just going to flip through all of these um, cells in the interest of time. Eventually, we get a nice little block. Looks probably something like what you'd expect to see from a CTD plot if you were plotting it through Seabird or through some other library. Um, salinity, temperature, density. So let's look at a bad one. This is what the plot should look like at the end of the day. I've plotted this in ODB for the sake of time. Uh, see, small. No. So when I'm doing this at C, this is roughly the order that I go through. The sixth spot is empty because I may need to loop back through and we do this again and again and again until it all looks nice and happy, just like my face. <laughs> Sometimes it's not so happy. Uh, so loading the data, plotting the data, ignore that comment for now until the plot shows up. takes a little bit of time, and we see that I've somehow sent the CTD magically 15 kilometers in the air, and then <laughs> about to seven or eight kilometers into below the water surface. So there are a lot of problems in there. And what actually happened on that cruise was that we had um, sea cable transmission errors. So there were electrical problems that were fucking up the whole signal. Oh. Are we not allowed to swear? <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <sighs> well, to him it was personal. That's how he felt. It was very personal. Um, so usually at C, before I do anything, I would make a copy of the data because when you're running on four hours of sleep, it's very easy to screw up your only copy of data, and then you have to respond back to your PIs back on land. Well, why did you lose everything? It's not to lose everything. But we can then take a look and see that all of this data is here. And if anyone has any questions at any point, feel free to say something. Um, yes? Um, so, cast out sleep function that automatically divide the uh, yes. So if you have data from multiple casts in the same writer, then the function is going to split that into a cycle of casts. Not really. It's designed for a, a single CDP cast in the okay. crowd. It's not for the thread uh, kind of device to keep diving. Yeah, it could be extended. Uh, that library is actually. Standard augmented method. Okay, so if you decide to follow the standard paper and if you never heard about it, check it out. It's amazing because you pretty much can create your own method and then attach it to a standard data frame. Mm -hmm. So you can create like very advanced slides like that, very useful. Yeah. Okay, well, the loading happens. Um, the CTD library loads and sets the index to pressure by default. So what I'm doing here is I'm dropping the index because I want to work with the pressure and remove everything that's 15 kilometers in the air and below the Earth's crust. And so by doing that, um, 
I can now, by resetting the index, I can now see that we've can now work with that pressure index in the range. Over here, I'm simply truncating the values to uh, five decibar and 6,000 decibars worth of data. The seafloor is only 5,000 meters decibars deep. So definitely the things that were seven and 8,000 meters deep don't need to be there. Now that we've removed the clearly bad data, we can plot, but we still have some sort of spiky transmission problems and it's still going below 5,000 meters. So we, I kind of glossed over this before, but this is the pandas flavor, which allows you to kind of chain all of these commands together. What I've done is I've then broken them out separately. So we have this remove above water function. I did it manually just to kind of get rid of things that may not be caught. And then the despiking function will turn it from all those spikes down there to removing most of the spikes. The low pass filter removes a little bit more and then removing pressure reversals in the CTD data cleans it up even more. Can I make a comment about the pressure reversals? So you have to be careful with that map because it's not the native map. Some pressure reversals may be true data, like it happened, but most of them are because you are the boat is wrong and the CTD is going up and down. So if you're doing like the sort of turbulent microstructure kind of thing, never do that. Eventually, they await. Yeah. But if you just want to clean past or measure scale analysis, that's fine. Yeah. There are different ways to do it. So, if you'd like to have a talk about that, we can talk about that. Uh, we do some interpolation just in case there are any bin scans that were dropped. And that cleans, I mean, it doesn't really look much different. At some point, we've kind of and through, um, we bin the data to move out any more jitter that shouldn't be there. And then we finally smooth the data. And this is about as good as you probably need it for most purposes. This still isn't reference grade data. You would want to use water samples of some sort to um, calibrate it. Uh, there are still problems in the data. Uh, if you remember, I set the default window from five decibar to 10 decibar. If people want to use data from zero to five decibar, it hasn't been extended up yet. Um, there's this little spike at the surface, but that shouldn't be there because we're in the mixed layer. So that needs to be removed. Um, there might be a little bit of offsetting from the water samples not aligning with your sensors. Um, so that would need to be worked on as well. We have an applied directions for viscous heating and so on and so forth, but they progressively get smaller and smaller and usually go past um, the amount of decimal points that people normally care about. And that's it. Anybody have any questions on this part? Yes. Yes, you can read in bottle files. Um, it was an oversight on my part to not prepare something for bottle files because I mostly don't work with it, but you can come and talk to me back there and we will talk about that. Yes. The data went in as a Seabird CMV file. Yes. Compressed. Compressed. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, if you so there was a problem here. <laughs> this package is kind of old. I designed it a long, long time ago using Canvas panel. Canvas panel was deprecated in view of accurate. So we have to rewrite that part in Excel. It works if you don't read your Canvas. But pretty much what we're going to have is a selection of multiple tabs, right? And for the section, I can show you an example that we had that's non interpolated. If you want it to be interpolated, we have a library for that, but you have to adjust the scales because C is usually from X sets, usually most of the time larger than B. However, there is a library called Diva. Uh, Hi, Diva. And there is a library called Hi, Diva, which is the state of art for this kind of interpolation. We're not going to show you because that library is not well packed. It's four was installed. It's, it's wrapped for trend, and it's a dropping uh, directory. And I'm working on patching that to yeah. actually create a part of that history on the phone. So the right answer is to be determined. Yes. If you've used ODB before, that diva that are a lot of section plots that are made for repeat hydrography, transects, things like that, that is the algorithm that they use. And that algorithm is supported by the EU. So that's kind of what the standard is. The algorithm is rock solid, it's great. Yeah. The package installation is terrible. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, oh, well, no, I was sorry. Um, could you just mention really quick for people who <clears throat> are less familiar with CHDO, how much of this you see is in a CPD problem and you don't know what it is? I, uh, spit out blood on every cruise in order to get this data queue seat before we come to shore. So, yeah. Uh, as soon, more or less, as soon as the data is in CCHDO, it is classified as reference grade data. You can put it into your models. They use it to calibrate Argo floats. Um, if there's a difference between the data and a model, the data is good. The methods, um, CCHTO's data runs back, to, it primarily holds GoShip now. GoShip used to be known as Clivar, used to be known as Woes, used to be known as Scorpio, used to be known as um, something else. But this is the global measuring program that has gone on since the 50s and before that. So this is kind of the reference grade data. Yeah, it was meant to be a leading question, mostly that a lot of this stuff that you showed is already done on data that you can download. Yes. So people, if you download the data from there, you don't need to also redo all these steps because it's already there. Yes, if you want, so this is to put it into this two, one or two decibar bin form that you would then download off of it. This is kind of what I do when I am in the field. You probably don't do the Windows Move window, right? You I have a different window that works. Okay. Yeah. Well, we should probably yeah. move on. But let's move okay, on. We'll be here to answer. We will be here. Questions. Yeah. We have a test. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to. Um, control on Zoom. Cool. How many people have used, uh, how many people know what OOI is, if the observatory is an issue? Oh, not too, not too bad. How many of you have used o OOI data? A number of you? Cool. 
So the uh, over here. for those of you who don't know, the Ocean Observatories Initiative is uh, a large NSF program that um, includes several components to uh, basically make observatories on the seafloor. One of the big components of it is the cabled array, which I'm showing here. It's a fiber optic cable off the coast here that's got hundreds of instruments on it. And it's collecting lots and lots of data in real time uh, back to the shore. Uh, and you can plot data that is, uh, you know, was collected less than a second ago from it. Um, and I'll show you, I'll point you to some resources for how to do that. We're not going to do that today. Um, there's lots of different ways to get OOI data. Uh, the data portal uh, is one way, and that um, I find to be pretty difficult. So we're not going to really touch on that today, but if you want to, talk, to learn more about the data portal, I can do that. The same uh, goes for M2M. We're not going to do M2M today, but I'll point you towards some cool notebooks that do M2M, and uh, it's one way to get data from uh, OI. It's probably the best way right now to get data uh, pro programmatically from the system uh, for certain kinds of data anyways. Um, the raw data server is cool, but most of the data in there are raw. That means they haven't been processed, they haven't been converted into very usable units, except for the KMHD video data. That's probably the best place, and certainly now, currently, the only place to get all of the OOI uh, KMHD high-resolution video data. That, those data are really cool. There's lots and lots of information in there, and if you want to work with the Cam uh, HD video data, let me know. I can help you with that. We're not going to talk too much about that today. Uh, Iris is where we store the seismic data, and Iris is working really. Work, Iris works really well. So if you're a seismologist, that's a great place to get seismometer data and hydrophone data from OOI. Today, though, we're just going to talk about two different ways to get OOI data. One is ERDAP, and that's going to be talked about by Felipe uh, in the next ten minutes. And I'm going to talk to you about a, a new sort of experimental way of getting data from OOI, which will hopefully be the way of the future. Um, a group here at the University of Washington uh, as part of the Ocean uh, Interactive Oceans project has started putting some of the OI data into uh, Azure buckets, I'm sorry, uh, Amazon S3 buckets. And I'm working as well putting some of these data into uh, Azure bucket, Azure blob storage. So eventually uh, we hope that all of the OOI data will be in this sort of format, but right now uh, there is just, can you all see this? Can you read it? Does, does it need to be bigger? A little bit bigger? Yeah. Bigger? Bigger. How about that? Uh, hopefully more of these data will be there. Um, but right now there's a, a, a large subsection of the OI uh, shallow water profiler data, which uh, these profilers have CTDs and other really cool instruments on them. Uh, and you can work with those data here uh, uh, this week uh, using the techniques I'm about to show you. The best way to Currently, in my view, to look around at OI data and try to understand what's there is through the uh, uh, the inspector. Let's see if I can. I'm not sure you. So this is the inspector. And there's a link on this uh, notebook for you to get here. But this uh, uh, this system for exploring the uh, this. Uh, the instruments on the system is probably the easiest and the nicest. It's got maps. Uh, it's got uh, uh, visual descriptions of where the data is and what's available. We're going to plot today the CTD here. And as you can see, there's quite good coverage of this CTD all the way back to 2015 and ending today or just a second ago. Uh, there's a... Um, there's a the, there's this stream here for the science stream, which includes a bunch of different uh, um, properties that are measured by the CTD. So you can see pressure and temperature and conductivity and all of that stuff in here. Um, Don uh, Setuan, who, uh, who who built the system for uh, who started putting these data on Amazon, has his own little browser here. Um, I have a link to this as well. So these are all the data that are on Amazon, and those are, these are the data that you can get using the techniques I'm about to show you. Um, and you can browse the, the, the data here in that cryptic format, which you can decipher with the other website. We're hoping to make all this a lot easier in the future. But if you have any questions about this, happy to help you find data and access data that you want to work with. But there's tons of data uh, currently there, and there's lots more in other places as well. So I want to show you how to 
open Zara groups from Amazon S3 remotely, uh, lazily, that is to load them without actually downloading the data. We're going to learn a lot about Dask today, or we're going to use Dask in a couple of different ways today. How many of you use Dask uh, often or on a regular basis? Not very many of you. I want to change that. I want all of you to be using Dask all the time because it is really what Pangeo is all about. I mean, if you're not using Dask, you're not using the cloud as efficiently as you might be able to. Um, we'll do some resampling using using Dask and, uh, and, and plot some data using uh, HP plot. So starting a cluster, this is a really cool new thing that Matt uh, Rafflin built. It's the, uh, it's the Dask uh, control button here. Um, it's, uh, it allows you to create a new Dask cluster. Just by pressing the new button, you can scale it up and scale it down, and it automatically connects you to the client. So you've got a client. If you start one, you already have a client in your workspace here. I have 20 workers ready to go. So that's super awesome, and that takes up, oh, takes up a lot of the difficulty or just cruft of starting Dask uh, cluster. Um, and then uh, it's got the task stream and the progress will be over here for Dask. And we can watch what happens when we do stuff here. We're going to import a couple of things that we're going to need. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to... Oh. Questions? Where? You don't have it. What do you mean you don't have it? Don't have what? Yeah, well, clients, uh, it's new. I'll, I'll push. I'll push it. I'll push all my changes to it. So there, your, your your notebook is a little bit different because I've made some updates. I you can run through it if you want. I probably recommend that you wait and run through it after I'm done because I'm going to go really really fast and you're not going to be able to keep up. I got four minutes left. Yes, Amelia. Um, I would wait, uh, you know, you're not going to have an enjoyable time running this yourself because you're, you're probably, yeah, your, your workers will take forever to start up. I already have, a, I already had a desk um, uh, cluster ready to go. Um, so it's probably better for just, just to watch for now, but the notebook is there. It will run for you. You can do all the things that I just described for you. And if you have any questions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to come talk to me afterwards. <clears throat> Anyways, we're going we to report something and then we're going to create we're going to use Dask delayed functions, and that means we're going to create a function that we're going to have Dask run uh, by itself on a bunch of different workers. And in order to do an easy way to do that, one way to do it for certain things like this is to create delayed functions in a list, and then throw it to Dask, and Dask will knows what to do with it. We'll farm it out to all the workers. So we're going to create this function, which does the opening of uh, the Zara groups, and. Um, you pass to this function just a string that says where where it is on S3, where in the bucket, uh, and then it opens it and gives you back the object. Um, and so then we're going to uh, create a list of delayed functions, uh, and that takes just um, like you know a microsecond, right? So we created a, a giant list of things to for for Dask to do, but it hasn't done anything with it yet, right? All of the 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 instructions for how to open an entire year, well, no, wait a second, we, only 20, 20 days worth of data were given, were created, and they haven't been actually executed yet. But we're going to do that execution in the next um, couple of cells here. So we're going to import compute because we're going to need that, and then we're going to do the compute uh, and pass to compute the list um, item-wise. And what that'll do is Dask will... Uh, the Dask schedule will, far, will farm out every single item in the list, which is a delayed function, to one of my Dask workers. I have 20 of them right now working. And all of them will go out, and individually, they will get, they will load uh, the czar group, and then pass you back the object. So we just loaded um, about 400 megabytes of data in five seconds. Yeah. Czar is a, uh, is a, is a data file format, or, or uh, I, I suppose you could call it, but it's really a group of files, and it's a way that uh, it's a very good way of storing data in the cloud because X-Array can operate on Zar files lazily and slice and dice it lazily. That means out of memory, it means without loading it or just with loading the metadata, and it only actually loads or downloads the data when it needs it. So Zar is awesome for storing data in the cloud. So we read all the metadata in five seconds for, I think we have about um, 
we'll find out exactly how much we have. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw away some bad ones because there's some bad ones that, that where there's no days, well, one, one of them. So we have 19 days left. Uh, we've, we're going to concatenate them into a single data, uh, data set because they're a list of data sets. So we just concatenate them together. And, um, and this is the information about the data set. And as you see, all these, uh, there's all, this, all the data that we looked at previously on the uh, data team website. All those, uh, all those parameters are here. A bunch of uh, labels. And I'm going to uh, move the seawater pressure out of the, out of the uh, uh, into, into the data. This is a little idiosyncrasy of OI NetCDF files. Uh, and then uh, I'll just show you a little bit about them. So yeah, so that's about 360 megabytes and it's uh, 1.6 million uh, points uh, that we have loaded really, really fast. Now what we're gonna do is resample the data. This is one second data. We're gonna resample it at, I think, four minute samples. This, is, this would be really, really hard if you didn't have X-ray uh, and DAS because like, you know, there's huge gaps in the data, right? There's an entire missing day. Uh, there might be lots and lots of missing data. DAS is really smart about being able to, um, or sorry, X-ray is really smart about being able, knowing where the data are that you want to uh, work on. So to um, to uh, reduce the data like this into four minute bins, super good, super fast, and it will farm this project out to a bunch of workers as well. This takes about a minute and a half. I noticed that you guys have done a little bit of waiting um, so far today, so I feel like you guys can can handle this um, while we wait. Right now, what's happening is that it's most most of the work involved here is actually creating the Dask graph, and so that means that the Dask scheduler is figuring out how to rechunk those data, um, how to uh, structure this problem so that it can efficiently farm the problem out to a bunch of workers. And once it has that uh, all figured out, it's got what's called the Dask graph or the Task graph and then it can uh, work through the task graph and all of the tasks will show up here. Um, it will uh, work on them and uh, you'll be able to see how, uh, how uh, our progress through this particular problem, which is, a, which is a really big problem. It's really hard, but it's probably gonna take about 10 seconds once the graph has been generated. Um, there's probably better ways to generate the graph that I'm doing right now. If we had, one, we had someone who was better at DASK or better at X-ray here, um, they would um, probably tell me how to do this way faster. Anyways, this is showing you what's going on when what what workers are doing what. So there's workers on this side right here. So each one of these is a worker, and each one of these workers gets a job and does a thing and then passes information back. What you see with all this white here means that it's whatever I'm doing is terrible. It's it's um, very very inefficient. There's a lot of workers that are waiting around to do and doing nothing. And this is again because. Uh, I don't know enough about X-ray to make this work better. But if I had more time, I could probably figure it out. So now we have, uh, at, at this point, uh, a, um, a resampled on four minute scale set of, I think that was 20 days worth of uh, dissolved oxygen data is what, we, is what we yanked out of there. Here we yanked out time, pressure, and, and DO. And, um, Took us about, I guess, what is that? About a little bit, about 100 seconds to do those those 360 megabytes. So it's processing the data at about 30 uh, megabits, which is probably about as fast as you're going to get between data centers. Because remember, we're on Google Cloud here, and the data are on Amazon. So they're have to, they're going to have to pass the data between them. So this is slower than it would be if the data were in Google, but it's still pretty fast. And you didn't download any of these data to your computer yet, right? All 400 meg megabytes of data, you didn't download any. And we spent two minutes um, uh, processing it, and we'll just plot it using HP plot here. Um, Oh, oh, by the way, the next version of X-Ray will have the stuff, uh, all these uh, HV plots in it, but it doesn't now. So what I'm doing is converting those, uh, that X-Ray into a data frame, uh, into a pandas data frame so that I can use HV plot on it. And then uh, I import HV plot and I do an HV plot scatter plot. So these are the, these are the 10 days of, uh, 
10 days of data from that system uh, plotted on a scatter plot. You can use a data shader plot or, um, or, a, or a surface plot or all kinds of different ways. You can plot all the data, all million points on it using a data shader scatter plot using HP plot, that's, that's cool to do, but I don't have time to show that, anyway. More resources down here, um, lots of really cool uh, notebooks by lots of them are from Friedrich, who helped with this. Also, shout out to Don, who uh, got those data into uh, AWS. Two cool um, notebooks showing you both how to find and work with M, uh, M2M, how to do real-time plotting, which is really cool, and then some other, uh, uh, repos that have lots and lots more notebooks for doing kind of the stuff that I did right now. Does anyone have any questions? Question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I kind of did that, but I re went really fast. Let's do it again here. Oh, I closed it. Sorry, yeah, the question is how do we how did we how did we determine uh, the string that that uh, told us where the data is the URL endpoint right? The czar URL. It's a bucket URL. This thing here. So uh, this is the this is the name of the bucket. But IoT data slash data, and I tacked on the name of the stream. And this thing here comes out of the, uh, you, you can find that in here, in the inspector. And I can show you how to do that. It's not super easy, but eventually what we're going to do is we're gonna get all of this stuff in X-ray and then we'll have a catalog that makes it way easier to figure out where things are and you won't have to do all this stuff. But for now, you have to know that. and. For now, the best thing is the thing that was created by the OI data team, for sure. And then, yeah, so all you need, you don't really need to go to the AWS store browser unless you aren't sure that it's there, but all of the profiler data is there. And this is basically the platform and the, uh, oh, this is the node, this is the platform, this is the device, this is the street. I just wanted to add that on Dask, that, that would be cover a lot more tomorrow, like we'll give you the tutorial uh, tomorrow. So if you have questions, you can ask the help desk, but also tomorrow, uh, um, whoever's presenting, Johanna, can go to more Dask. Profiler mooring. All of this data are in here, but I decided to plot some CTD data. And then this right here. And then if you go up, So here, we should have, oh yeah, here we go. Here's the M to M endpoint. So this has got the information that I have in that, in that, uh, in that string, plus the stream, plus this part here. Where? Like, you give it that string name, mm -hmm. right there, the Zark group base. Mm-hmm. So below that, mm -hmm. so the Zark group base, mm -hmm. and then you're having a date start. So this is the base. So this is the base. Okay. So if if so, what uh, so what Don has done is he has taken the OI data from these streams, and he's um, part of the map into uh, Zar Zars uh, groups. These are Zar groups here by day. So this, so this is a, this is a czar group right here. So are you just creating the name? Yep. So knowing that, he, he, that's how knowing that's how he how he broke the data apart. What I've done here is I've used the date time. Um, I've used date time dot date, and then the uh, date time dot time delta functions, which are both part of date time part of the date time package, to build that that uh, that string. So I I take the uh, the the string for the day, um, and so I add the day of the start, and then and then I add uh, uh, a time delta, which is days i, which is in this uh, for loop, which is range of number of days, twenty days, 
loops through, creates a, a uh, our group is going to be the main, yeah. And then your duplicate thing. So this is a czar group. This is the this is the full Amazon endpoint for that czar group that exists. Then this function up here, right? I append the delayed function uh, of OpenZar and passing the czar group. And this is the function open czar group. So each each worker has to open it, has to create its own S3 file system object with an anonymous true token. Then what it does is it goes and opens the the czar group using xr.openzar, passes past the uh, uh, the, the store which is uh, uh, an S3 map of the czar group, passing the S3 file system as well. Uh, consolidated equals true means that you we're reading the metadata directly from the metadata file in the czar group rather than soliciting it. This is, makes it much much faster to do consolidated it equals true. And then uh, if it's not there, it just returns none. And we got one of those, right? One, one, one day gave us nothing. And that's why we have that. That's our none. And, we move on. But we should move on. So if there are any more questions about this, please let me know. I'm going to try, of course, another layer of abstraction. I'm going to share my screen with Zoom so I can use my own computer. <laughs> She's going to share the Zoom screen there. Fingers crossed. So, uh, All right, it works. People can see. Good. Yeah. Awesome. And so the sound still come from me. Yeah, I guess the sound comes from me. And if you can remove the apple bar. Yes, I'm trying to. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have live captions. <laughs> So, uh, this is something that was from my previous presentation that I couldn't show because I didn't have my computer, but it's very, very important, and I want to be very brief about it. How you do vertical sections on models, and I touched base that this is very hard. So, yeah, I'm going to explain it to you. Oh my god, that's not working. So, pretty much is that me, I'll tell you, I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry, it didn't work. <laughs> Terrible jokes. <laughs> so, but the, 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 the actual message is, I have specific samples for many different models. I have an example for FVCOM, one for ROMs, one for HICOM, and one for MOM, if I'm not mistaken. If you work one of those, come see me later. And we are working on a unified way, so that actually leads in a library. We started our sprint here at, uh, oh no, Batra again? Hello? Yeah. yeah. Nope, it's not working. Like it, it flashes and it turns off automatically. Yeah, it can be that fast, right? I'm sorry. So people in the back, can you hear me? Um, if we can actually make the captions. Oh, it's back now, awesome. Um, okay, so let's go to the actual notebook. We are doing the data story is here. So you, you heard the CDD story, you hear the czar and cloud story, and now I'm gonna tell a NERDAP story. Who heard about NERDAP before? Great, so NERDAP is actually catching on. So it's a new way of serving data, right? And you have table DAP and grid DAP and grid DAP. The table DAP is very advanced and works pretty well. The grid DAP, not so much, we're getting there. So I'm gonna show you a table DAP example. Who here heard about a Python client for NERDAP? All right, the last hand is, so there, are, there is only one uh, Python client. There are two for R, if I'm not mistaken, zero for MATLAB. <laughs> and there is a message here. The message is, uh, and, and Massimo, uh, where are you? So Massimo and I, we're kind of old. 
uh, on the Python community. So we remember when you told people, move to Python because it's free, move to Python because it's open, so it's better for science. And then our speech changed to move to Python because you have all these nice tools like pandas and X-ray. And now our, spe our speech changed again. Now we say move to Python because that's the only way to do it. So I hope you're actually all pretty much convinced on moving to Python right now. So we load our object, our AirDAP object. We add the server, it's just a URL for the server, and we have this E object. What can we do with it? We pretty much can construct the RESTful uh, URL using the RESTful API in your app and access it using all those multiple responses. For example, here I'm gonna get a search URL and I'm gonna get a comma separated value response because that's a response that I can just read in Pandas, right? So I read that in Pandas and I'm printing the results. I have about a thousand table depth data sets there, zero grid depth and zero WMS. So this server pretty much serves table depth. Sorry, table depth is for table data, grid depth is for grid data. Sorry, I should make that more clear. So grid depth is gonna host satellite image models, things like that. Table depth, time series, or anything that you can fit on a table, right? So there is all these ways to interact with the server and there is a, a whole web interface I'm going to show you later. I, for now, I'm only going to show the AirDAP by interface. And there is this method get a categorized URL. So I pretty much can choose a category based on an attribute and a value. And I'm going to get all the data sets that fills in those descriptions. So I'm looking for a CDM data type whose value is trajectory. So pretty much looking for gliders, Argo, or anything that have a trajectory. Of course, for this to work, your metadata must be correct. So please add metadata to your data and follow these standards. And now I've reduced my search, like we had a thousand data sets to about 500 data sets. So there is about 500 trajectory-like data sets in there, but I still don't know what's glider, what's not. Um, so I don't really want to all that. So I'm going to filter by those that have salinity in it. So, and also I'm going to filter by time and geography. So I can create a dictionary with mean time and max time. Uh, actually, there's a mistake here that I just noticed. So I'm pretty much changing mean time twice. So it's probably going to use just this one. And I have a bounding box, geographical bounding box, and I'm searching for C water practical salinity, that's a CF standard name, and I'm going to get trajectory. I'm pretty much trying to narrow down my search to something that's meaningful to me, to my research. And I found one data set. We can work with one data set, right? So we get the actual name of the data set. This is a CTDGBM glider. I have no idea what that means, so we can explore the data set more. So let's try to actually download that data set and explore it. So we have the return name for the data set ID. I know it's a table that. Now I'm gonna get all these variables here and I'm gonna for get the download URL. If you click here, that's gonna be uh, open a new tab with the, the data on the default format. The default format if I'm not mistaken is an HTML. But we don't want an HTML to check that data. We actually have something that we can read on our machine. Because pandas is so natural for tabular data, we have a two pandas method in there.py. So we just choose our index column. And I, again, I ask it to parse the dates because I know it's a time series and voila, I have that data. So we went from a server to browsing that server to actually find something that's meaningful to us. And pretty much that's it, what I had to present about their depth. So now we can play with that data. Uh, we also have a true X-ray method. It's probably gonna be useful when read depth catches on, but at the moment, two pandas is enough. And now we can plot it, like this is that data frame. I'm just in, uh, getting the latitude and longitude, adding some padding so I can actually have a map that goes beyond the bottom box. I made a plot small on purpose so they can fit this slide. Please don't do that. Uh, make a big plot so old people like me can see. And I'm plotting the trajectory for the glider. Uh, one thing that you should 
bear in mind, like BeardApp is starting to use high level Unicode for units. And if you try to do that, to select columns, you have to use the raw. Otherwise, Python is going to try to interpret that Unicode. So that actually beat me, and I had no idea that was happening. It took me a while to realize that. Like sometimes high level uh, abstracts assume too much, and you need to take a step back. And here's just a Matplotlib example of the, that, the vertical profile of that glider. Someone asked about the vertical profiles for CDD. It's kind of similar what you do. Uh, I'm doing a scatter plot of a section of all the dies, and this is how the data looks like. It's hard to interpret that if you don't have the trajectory, because as you can see, this data went back and forth, that line from multiple times, and then came back again. So usually you need to plot them together, right? The track and the, the track. And the track can be in time or in space. Ideally, you should have two axes here to show that. Um, I have an exercise for this, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to let you do it by yourself and you can bug me on Slack or on the help desk later, but pretty much I want you to customize and do your own search, right? Um, so instead of that, what I'm going to show here is just a final plot of that glider, the same glider, and I'm creating a TS diagram with the data like I had temperature and salinity in there. It's just because TS diagram is very important and sometimes people don't realize how easy they are to produce. Pretty much I'm using the GSW library to create fake lines of density and then I plot those fake lines of density and overlay the scatter plot in there. Okay. Um, so the final exercise would be for you to do your own query, especially if you can do the web interface. So if you click here, this is the server, it's going to open for you the web interface. Sorry, I forgot to ask. Are you following along on your conduits? Do you have that notebook with you? So click on that URL, just so you know what's going to happen. What you're going to see is the AirDAP web interface. So a lot of people go straight there to create their queries. And once they have the final URL, they get the data. What I did here was to construct that URL programmatically. That means, am I using AirDAP Pi all the time I want to use AirDAP? No. If you know what you want and it's easy to do via the web interface, use the web interface. You have to use the Pi if you're doing something programmatically, like an app or a website where you always want the latest data with certain rules of time and geographical constraints, right? That's it for AirDAP. So this one is a little bit more complex because we're not starting off from one server. We're starting off from a geo catalog. Who heard about geocatalogs before? Joseph Emilio and Matthew. That's great because geocatalogs are a horrible, horrible interface. So the fact that you didn't hear about them means that you're saying person, people. But they're very useful. And if you have any questions about that, you can come to me and I'll redirect you to Micah, who is the expert, because I'm not going to answer any questions about the CSW, but he can. I'm actually going to show you an example that you can copy and paste and adapt. So similar to AirDAP, we, create, we need to create a query. So I'm asking for a bound box, and I'm giving, you, I'm giving it a coordinate reference, the CRS. I'm asking for a time limit here. So pretty much I'm getting now and 14 days before and 14 days ahead. So it's today, sorry. It's, yeah, time delta 14, now minus seven. Yes, it's today, times ahead and times before. So I'm getting kind of real time data. And I'm asking for just two variables, two surface uh, northward velocity and eastward velocity. So I'm actually looking for velocity data. This is my full query. So pretty much I only created ver Python variables for my query. I didn't use any library so far. Is that clear? Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to load this library called OWS Sleep, and it has a module named FES that can query the CSW catalog. All these are the open geospatial consortium standards. So you're going to find this pretty much in any geospatial library. They are kind of your bowls. 
That's why we don't really like them so much, but they are very powerful. And if you create layers on top of them, you find data automatically. So the first filter that we're gonna create is a date filter to actually find query for the catalog within those dates that I created. And then I'm gonna assemble the filter with some things like, I want all the characters uh, as text. I'm gonna search as text. I'm gonna search for those variables, for those velocity names. I'm gonna exclude anything that has genome on it because there are a lot of models that has genome and I don't want models. I'm actually looking for HF radar. And then I'm gonna pretty much create, uh, concatenate all these filters together. So this filter list, uh, as you can see, I'm using fast and and or and not. So these are all the fast filter commands. So I'm concatenating this filter. Now that I have it, I can actually feed it to the CSW. This is just a function that feeds it to the CSW and returns the records. Why I'm doing that as a function instead of a direct call? It's because CSW is paginated. So if I do it as a call, it's gonna give you the first page. But if this query returns a thousand pages, I'll give you to do the query over and over again. This function just kind of abstracts that out. So I can call this function and it will paginate it to the end and give me all the results. This is the actual catalog. So it's data.iuse.csw. And I start the catalog object, I add the filter, I'm asking for 10 pages and maximum records, 10,000 records. And this is what you found, found five records. And as you see, they're all HF reader. So it's pretty powerful. Now, if I work with HF reader and I know the endpoints for these data sets, do I need the catalog? No, go straight to the data. This is for some people that don't know where the data is. If you're just browsing for data and you want to find whatever is out there. So I chose one of those and I'm querying for the abstracts just to see if this is what I want. And yes, it surface the loss from HF radar. It represents 0 0.3 to 2.3 meter of the ocean and all that. So I'm gonna check the attributes, pretty much everything that, that I expect is in there. There is a bounding box, identifier and etc. So this is what's in there, U, V, latitude, longitude. Um, there are some interesting uh, metadata for the catalog when it was last modified. So they, this was, the data lives in a server somewhere. The catalog queries the data and updates itself. So this was the last time the catalog was updated. So pretty recent, right? So it's almost near real time data. I did run this on the 26th, so if you run it again, we probably get uh, a different date. And the bottom box matches what I wanted. Now, here's the thing. I, I, I know a lot about the data, but I still don't know how to get it, right? I need to find an endpoint to get it, be that an open that endpoint, an early that endpoint, or a URL. So we have to sniff the URL. And there is this uh, library called geolinks that sniffs for the services. So we have many ways actually to access the data. There is eight, uh, web pages, there is open app, there is WMS and all these other formats. I'm not really gonna discuss all that, but it could be here AirDAP or many others. I actually want the open that. So now I, actually, I have an actual endpoint, right? So I can actually get the data, finally get the data. So I just feed that endpoint in X-Ray, I select what I want to plot. I don't really want to plot all the time series. I just want to plot the day before today. Select the variable that I want to plot. And this cell here is not that important. It's just that when you're doing quiver plots, you don't want the quiver size to be the speed. You want all the quivers to be the same size but I want to preserve the speed information to color them with the speed. So this is what I'm doing there. Pretty much a curtle pie plot, which are all experts now because we had a whole afternoon just about curtle pie. Not really. I love when I say curtle pie, the lemon puts ricotta cheese. <laughs> and finally, we have a plot. <laughs> so this is all the HF radar data from yesterday that we had no idea existed on that endpoint. We went from catalog query to actual data. 
who here thinks this is cool? Who here would try to use this for their projects? It's not so much, but it's a, a data discovery tool. However, if you think this is too much, you don't want to learn about OGC standards, you don't want to use this notebook, you don't want to go to these libraries, there are web interfaces for that. And Mike, are you going to talk about that on your lightning talk, showing the web interface for the catalog, or should I talk it now? So there is many portals. Um, one of them is the EDS browser, where you can find models. Uh, NCI has uh, what's the name? Let me forget. I'm drawing blank now. Yeah, the geo portal. So you can actually use the web interface to find those things. You don't really need to do all that. You only do that if you're creating programmatic things like with the air deck. I have an exercise here that you don't need to, to do it right now, you can do it later, is to create your own future, to find your own kind of data, just move ahead in the interest of time. Is, do we still have time for the hurricane one, or? Yeah, oh yeah, sorry. Okay, so this is one thing that you'd like to do with these data discovery tools. Um, just to show you a variety of other tools, I'm not gonna be using their DAP and I'm not gonna be using the catalog, I'm gonna be using a third one that's Cox. But here, instead of just showing you how to find the data and, and create filters, I'm actually gonna do something that has an end goal. So if you go to the National Hurricane Center, they have all these GIS files and shape files for the hurricane predictions, the cones and the points where it goes. So we can download those and we can load them in GeoPandas, have their bounding box, and then search for the data within that bounding box. So I want to find all the data alongside the track of a hurricane. So this is for Hurricane Irma. Uh, as an exercise, there is a hurricane forming right now that's heading to Puerto Rico. So you can just change that code for that hurricane and you can rerun this. And if this is robust enough, it should just find the data for that one. I did that as SciPy, it worked. Um, so if anyone wants to do this, just try to find the code, go to the National Hurricane Center, change this line and only this line and everything should work in theory. So I'm gonna skip a little bit into the interest of time, but pretty much we fetch all the data from NHC. We download all the zip files for the, sh the shapes of the cones of the hurricanes. And we get the points and the tracks there. I create a dictionary with the colors for the names of the status of the storms at the point, like major hurricane, hurricane, subtropical depression, etc. just so we can color them on our map. I get the actual dates, so I'm choosing all the data within the dates of the prediction and the path of the cone. I do a little bit of a buffer on the cone because I actually want data that's near the hurricane as well. GeoPandas has your back. It can do, uh, actually this is a shapely object, but GeoPanda does the same. You do a buffer and it makes things a little bit thicker. So I'm, not, I'm getting data on the border as well, on the border of this bounding box. This is my bounding box. This is my time frame where I'm gonna look for the data. All this came from the GIS file from NHC. I didn't have to call them, so it should be all automatic. And now we're gonna create a query for co-ops using that information, I'm just feeding that information. I'm querying for sea surface height and wind, and I get a table, a pandas table back. So I'm also querying for wind speed, and that's my table. Now we can kind of put it all together. We need to put these two observations on the same time axis. Again, pandas has your back, or we're using the interpolation scheme with pandas to make them on the same time index. Uh, I'm interpolating everything to 15 minutes. They are from sometimes six to 10 minutes. So I'm usually interpolating to a lower frequency to avoid mistakes. And now we're gonna use a library that we're gonna talk more about it later. That's called Folium that creates the city maps and I'm gonna put all this information on the map. So we have hurricane points, we have hurricane cones, we have data. So we need to create yeah, no, same here. So we need to create a folio map. I'm add, also adding a WMS layer with temperature. And we're gonna style our cones so they have actual colors that are meaningful. And now I iterate 
to all the cons and points. Um, it's going not no idea. Yeah. So I'm just going to color them with that dictionary that I created. So a hurricane is going to be red, the top of the pressure is going to be yellow. Just plotting those things. Um, this is kind of complex, and I understand that I'm going way too fast, but you have this notebook and you have me to ask questions later. And voila, we created a map where we have all the dots for the hurricanes, the latest prediction con, and if you click here, you actually have a plot with the data. This is the time we say, ah. <laughs> And it was all automatic. The only variable that you have to tweak is the hurricane code. And this is only possible because we have all the servers to also discover the data, right? So if you're doing this kind of operational stuff, catalogs and servers where you can query with high level variables are very powerful. Okay, that's the end. So you're next with query data. Do you want to use this scheme that I have here or you want your computer? Do you want to use my computer or do you want to use yours? Yeah. Yeah. Let me just load for you. If you go back to the index. Yeah, I have the index here. Okay, perfect. So um, we will switch, not switch actually, not quite, but we'll talk about AUVs. And Felipe already, okay. He already uh, did a lot of that when he uh, examined OI glider data. So this will be a bit of rehash, but with different data. And actually, this notebook came mostly from Kamika, although I helped initially, right, when I pointed it to <laughs> so the two of us. Um, hopefully, how many of you know about Argo? All right, so this should be interesting. It, it is global. It's a global program uh, called, done collaboratively through multiple nations or groups. Uh, that's one thing that's cool. That, uh, regardless of what region you're interested in, unless it's coastal. If it's coastal, Argo is of no use to you. Um, okay, so, oh, this is in slide. Sorry, I don't. How do I change this? Is it a, uh, I don't w want it to you wanna, be. You want the slide or? No slide. No. Oh, not that. No, you're not on slide mode yet. You don't want the slide mode. Oh, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> I know. Got it. Okay. So we'll just import all the packages uh, that we'll be using, and we'll be using Erdap video, Erdap or Erdap again, um, because this group uh, it's based, it's hosted uh, um, in <coughs> or at least the group that uh, hosts the Erdap server is in France, if I may. And we'll be getting the data from Erdap. So we'll start constructing the query. Uh, we looked at this early on, and uh, they have multiple data sets, but the one data set that brings all the Argo floats together, it's called Argo floats. So um, we'll just use it. And um, Control plus. Control plus. Oh. Is that good or more? Okay, and this is just an example of um, an that request that would get you an image that will basically reconstruct programmatically. This ERDAP in some sense, all it does is helps it, um, it, it operates through constructions of URLs that then represent the requests that you issue. Yeah, I think Chris has said that ERDAP by a product client, but you can't really call a client for something that's using the rest of the API. Like you're just creating URLs. And and how many of you know what a RESTful API is? Okay. Um, maybe we can say more about that. But basically, no, this way. long URL it is it's effectively a RESTful API. It's a um, web-based, URL-based set of requests, of parameters, and arguments. Um, so we'll, we'll, um, there is the endpoint for the Ephraimer, the ERDAP, the Argo um, instance. And uh, now we'll set the constraints. Basically what we're asking for, the uh, time window, the longitude and latitude window. So we're constructing that before we actually issue the request. Um, and now we'll 
issue the final request. And note that here, we're only exploring the data in a particular spatial window. We're not gonna pull in any of the observational data, like temperature. So we're choosing um, right here, which variables we want back. Uh, and in this case, it's latitude, longitude, and date creation plus time, probably. So there's no temperature or anything else. Um, if you choose to play with Argo data and use this, you want to add the variables you're interested in. But uh, since you're pulling data from a remote server, you don't want to pull everything. Um, yeah. I don't know, but we can explore that. You can ask, ask us later. Um, I don't know, because BioArgo is a bit newer. I don't know if they treat it separately as more experimental. Um, so I don't know for sure if it's part of the same pool of Argo data. Uh, we can definitely explore it in the help desk or later on. Um, okay, so uh, this is pretty much the same that um, Felipe already did with the OI glider example. It's churning and done. And uh, the length of, so it returned the data frame and that tells you that there are 566 records um, returned. And that this is what the data frame looks like right there. So we just got latitude, longitude, and uh, date, and the year was extracted from the date. Again, just to um, give you a first order exploration of the data. Um, now we're just gonna create a plot, and take a look at uh, what kind of Argo data we have in this bounding box that is selected. Um, and we're using Cartopy to make a prettier plot uh, to give us better context. Uh, now it's just churning. And there it is. Um, so what we have now is a plot for the window that we selected, which is up here in the Pacific Northwest, sort of into Canada, uh, where the color represents the year for the Argo float. Um, so those are the Argo uh, paths, I guess, or tracks in, I already forgot what, I guess 2010 to 2019. Now, again, if you were actually looking for specific data to do something specific, then you would take the next step and say, I'm, I have enough data for what I need to do. I'm going to zoom in here or self-select just this year and grab the actual data that I want, uh, using pretty much the same um, steps that you already saw here. And the last bit is, uh, I guess, a te teaser on uh, prettier plotting. And you've already seen some of this. Uh, it's GeoViews or HoloViews. This is also known as the HoloVis stack. Felipe and Amanda will go into more depth uh, on advanced visualization tomorrow. So we have the data already. All we're doing is um, plotting it in a different way, in a more interactive way. So same kind of plot, except no legend, I just noticed. Um, and now we have the cover ability, and we can also zoom in like uh, Tim and Felipe have done. So that's Argo. Now you can go off and grab Argo data and combine it with OOI data, um, as long as they overlap. Uh, how do I go to, oh, F11? I can do that. F11, I pressed F11, but it didn't. No, no, <laughs> OK, thanks. I scrolled the full bar of the screen access. OK. I'm just going to open this notebook. Um, I think I'm going to skip it, but uh, for the most part, I'm just going to scroll through it. Um, it is, in some sense, sense, pretty much the same that we've saw, we've seen for Argo and for OI, except that this time it's hitting a different ERDAP server. It's what it's going to what's called the Glider DAC, which is uh, a glide, the Glider Data Assembly Center, an entity that was is sponsored by IUS and maintained by IUS, but it's really a, a broader collaboration and it includes data from multiple groups. Um, not just ones that are part of IUs, and that includes OOI data. Um, again, it's an ERDAP instance. The way you would query it, it's pretty much the same as what we saw for Argo, and pretty, pretty much the same as what you saw for um, OOI. Um, so the code is pretty similar. Again, we set criteria. Uh, here we're exploring um, all the data sets that we get, all the glider data sets. In this case, it's in the Pacific Northwest, and most of those are OOI, and a few are Nanus, so my organization. Um, we just take a look at what we get back to decide what we want to focus on or zoom in on. Um, and then I choose to uh, pick one glider and explore that one. Um, 
this. Ah, it is. Okay. Um, and again, uh, just using RDAP to interact with RDAP. In this case, we're going to pull in that one data set using a CSV response, read it into with pandas into um, um, a data frame. And this is sort of the catalog search against RDAP. This is not the data yet. And we look at what variables we got. Okay, and then we can zoom in to do a more specific query and start getting the data. Okay, so now we're going to, again, I'm just, don't worry, I'm just uh, flying through this so that you can go back to it if you choose to do better data in your project. Um, can I just take it for a minute very quickly because I, I just forgot to mention or mention very quickly. Redef has multiple responses. I use the comma separated file, but it's going to get an SDF file, a JSON, whatever it needs to be. That's why Redef is so successful. And in that example, we're actually getting a MATLAB file. So even that, if you're still a yeah. 900 MATLAB user, Redef has our back. <laughs> okay, don't use MATLAB. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, here it was just an example of. Uh, um, different formats that you could get from RDAP. Okay, so we finally isolated what data we wanted. Um, we composed a query, we transform it into XRA, and here's the data set that was constructed from the download from RDAP. Um, now, by this time, you should be familiar with that. We look at the temperature variable, there it is. Um, it's got 19,000 records. Uh, let's see, so we cleaned it up a little bit, set an index, and there is a data, uh, turn it into, uh, I believe, yeah, a pandas data frame. So now we're getting into something very familiar that we can start. What is that doing there? That's a stray data set, um, print out. And now we can um, have just use plain old matplotlib to create a section plot without any fancy interpolation. It's just scatter plots, but still, now you're able to visualize the data after doing a broad, query on a glider DAC, which has data from all over the place, from multiple institutions. Um, I think this is this may even be some of the same data that uh, OI data that Felipe showed. But we're just going to um, do a quick plot, a quick exploration of uh, where this glider is at, what it's, what it's doing. And we use GeoPandas for that, because it allows you to get results very quickly. Um, but we can also use Folium to ah, we request the data. And now we're just going to create a map in Folium where, okay, for some reason it's not showing it. Um, but anyways, you learn about Folium tomorrow. Yeah, in fact, we one hour. Maybe. Yeah, but uh, no, no, yeah, not at this point. So you get the gist that uh, um, you can query the glider that earned that. It has data from multiple groups, multiple gliders, even the same transect multiple times across years, and then isolate what it is. You explore what you get in many data sets that you get back. Uh, isolate what it is you're interested in based on whatever criteria. Maybe you know that a, a particular glider from OI was much better than the other or from this other glider, so you go to just those and then um, make follow-up request where you actually grab the data they're interested in, view the actual tracks, um, and then start using the data the way you need to. And mix it up with Argo. Excellent. Yeah. Any questions on AUVs? Yeah. Um, does this notebook work for both sleep glider and Scorpion? Yes, I think so. It's not, it it's doesn't not. know about the, the file, it's all about the server. So if you dig in the server, you will find it. So if I can go back to the issue of standards and, and structures, uh, so obviously Slocum and SQLite are very different technologies. My understanding also is not only do they operate differently, but the data files that they generate are quite different. Uh, the Glider DAC, um, the way it came together is that the, there was a community definition of an FCDF form, uh, convention uh, that follows that built on top of the common generic conventions and defined that, um, a single target for regardless of the glider type. Um, so when data gets submitted to the glider DAC, regardless of whether it's local or C glider, it goes in in the same format. And then that, go, that all gets posted uh, to RDAP. So not only is all the data regardless of the glider type available in RDAP, 
you can read it the same way pretty much. And you'll know though, whether it came from Slocum or Slipider, and then you can decide which writer is better. <laughs> So we'll, we'll have it out later. I can follow up on that. We're not going to present all textbooks, but we can run them. And the very first one is an example of really bad metadata that may be through the server. And how hard it is to deal with. So open that same the case and try to understand why it's so important to solve those problems at a very lower level. So the metadata propagation and can do all these kinds of stuff. Any other questions about AUV and AUV data? All right. They're all ready to do great projects with uh, Argo and Slocum and Siglider. I, I assume you could pass the uh, glider type as a query um, into the glider deck and, and decide, I hate Slocum. Just give me Siglider's or vice versa. So now we're switching gears to gridded data. Um, we're still sticking to uh, uh, observational data, not modeling data, because that will be tomorrow. You'll hear a lot about uh, big models uh, on Pangeo. Uh, but we wanted also to present some uh, tools or some examples for getting gridded data. Uh, we will focus exclusively on remote sensing because that's pretty helpful. But be aware that there's also other kinds of gridded data, observational gridded data, typically data products like the World Ocean Atlas or NCI that is essentially four-dimensional cubes. Uh, they do X and Y, latitude and longitude, depth, and the time step. Uh, and those are available in NetCDF, and you can use many of the same tools. Um, but we're going to stick with remote sensing. Um, this notebook was created largely by Shell, and I believe it came from other people as well. So it's been building up over time. And we combined a couple of elements uh, for this. Um, the, we're going to be querying the NASA CODAC, the Physical Oceanography DAC, and the DAC is the uh, acronym that uh, NASA uses for distributing their data by um, subdiscipline, in this case, Physical Oceanography. So let's uh, load the packages that we'll be using. Uh, they're pretty much the same kinds of packages, and then plus a few others that are specific to the CODAC, including CODAC Pi that gives us basically a catalog querying capability um, that the product wrote and a few other packages that are uh, intended to config parser and lxml to help us get a grip on what we get back from product pi whoops what this is on pangeo right uh no okay this is on my computer, okay but i still have that well you don't I'm going to try to fix it right away. I could just switch to my computer. It's probably easier if I do this. I'm going to install it's code back by, can you spell it? P O D A A C E Y. We have like an elevator song for technical problems. <laughs> Yes. yes, which, by the way, is a segue for our Conda help desk. So everybody yeah. that has Conda problems and installation then want to learn how to solve those things easier. Yes, just definitely by the end of the week, you should all be sold on, on why Conda is awesome and why it will really sell, uh, solve a lot of the problems you run into. Okay, thank you. Um, you ran that cell already, right? Yeah, I ran Okay. Okay. Um, before doing that, uh, if I can manage this, um, I'm going to open the Podak website. Now, I've never used it. So uh, probably like Shell, that's not what I do. Shell is an expert. She could probably spend all day telling you about everything that's in it. But like any other good um, data repository or source, it's got um, user-friendly uh, web applications that you can use. Oops that you can use to navigate and find the data that you're interested in, and I assume download it. Um, and that would probably be the more typical pathway for finding your data. Um, that's not what we'll be doing. And let's see. Sorry, how do I go? See, this is why they're called PC, personal computer. Yeah. It's, it's not all tab? No, I pulled the tab. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, 
So we'll query the, the product uh, catalog using product type, and then we'll be looking for a very specific SSD data set called MUR against Murad. That's a bird, actually. Um, and uh, to make things a tad easier, I'm defining um, a function to help us um, parse some of the catalog responses. And I will, let's not go into that just yet. And so we start the Kodak uh, object that we'll use to do the querying. Uh, there's an authentication. Basically, we have to register uh, with Kodak, and that's not unusual for um, data distributors. Um, there is a credential file that is on Pangeo, so you should be able to do exactly what I'm doing here. Um, that credential that we're using, I believe, is for tutorials. Uh, if you want to do this for your own work, you should probably register yourself and get um, your own credential file. But again, it'll, it will work for this purposes. What we're doing here is just reading the credential file um, and pulling out the username and password that is, that is uh, found in there. OK, so now we'll define uh, our query parameters. And mostly the time period, start and end. And um, we can't overemphasize enough that whenever you're querying remote systems, of course, you have to be aware of uh, the speed of your network and um, your computer, um, whether you want to be waiting a long time, but you also should try to be a good citizen and not issue huge queries that might burden other systems. So we'll be light. Uh, we'll be asking for 15 days of data. Um, some of the systems may have limits, built-in limits, but in this case, just 15 days of data gives us plenty to, to play with. Um, we use this, uh, this two-step process in the product pie uh, catalog. First, we search for data sets. We pass the start time and end time and this keyword, the MERV keyword, to look for that data set. OK. And, and again, here we're just querying metadata, so it's very fast. Um, now we basically, that gives us an XML string back, which is hideous, of course, it's XML. So that little function that I wrote will pull out what we need, that data set ID. And that's the data set ID. Um, and we'll, we'll need that in turn to uh, pass it to what's called the granule search. Uh, how many of you work with remote sensing, by the way? OK, so I assume at least 80% of you know what a granule is. Or no? Yes, how many of you know what a granule is? OK, <laughs> just shell. <laughs> I don't know how universal, if NASA started this, but uh, at least in terms of NASA um, um, lingo, it represents the uh, smallest unit, I guess, of data that is meaningful. And typically for something like MODIS, where you built up time series, it'll represent uh, the spatial area uh, at one time step. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so it's really your, your smallest unit of data. Uh, especially from Na in NASA lingo. So you'll get back granules. Um, we'll run it. You're not getting back data just yet. You're getting references to what granules or units of data exist. Um, and uh, here's another step that uh, turns the result of that first search, product pie search, into URLs. Um, and that's what we're getting. We got 15 URLs. And you can see, please don't read them all, but you can see that uh, here's one, and the date's not, um, it, it's semi meaningful. For example, 2018, the 60th day of 2018, the version of the data set, so it, it's valuable. Um, trouble is, is that this is um, the URL for accessing the files in a um, custom mechanism that is not ideal, that, that the product. Uh, um, the product developed. So we don't want to use that. We want to use open that. Um, and uh, one of the developers from uh, the main developer from uh, product Pi gave us this um, easy conversion to turn those URLs into open that um, URLs. Now, if I um, manage this uh, product Pi, I would build that into a utilities. Yes, I meant to give that feedback, but I didn't want to ask for more. That's how the fork works, right? Exactly. Exactly. So if as you end up using something this week, 
if you have something you don't like, um, tell us or tell the or tell us where you found it so that we can give feedback via GitHub. Okay, so now we have a set of op op opened up URLs that um, we can use with the same tools we've been using before. With XArray, we pass this URL to an opened up endpoint and we start exploring the data set. Um, so here is our XArray statement. Um, and because it's lazy loading, it's just bringing in the metadata. And that's what it looks like. So single granule, single time step. Um, and it tells you there the uh, spatial domain, which is global, apparently. Um, all the variables analyzed as a C, mask, CI extraction, and lots of comments, lots of attributes that are part of what's called the CF convention. Uh, Felipe mentioned CF, but it's a convention for metadata, especially in NetCDF files and for variable names. Okay, now again, uh, you want to look at what it is you're, you're getting into before just saying, get me all the data. And there's this nifty uh, way of, say, of looking at uh, what the size of the data uh, would be if you downloaded it. Um, and that's in megabytes. So that's uh, about 15 gigabytes. You, we don't want to download 15 gigabytes. Um, so what we'll do is define, again, this is global. We'll define, I believe at 0 0.01 degrees, and it's got multiple variables. We'll define a much smaller sub spatial subset and focus on that and download that once we can confirm that the data is not too big. Okay, so let's look at the attributes of the analyzed SST variable, which is the one we'll be looking at, and it looks like that. Okay, good. Um, we can look at the, the attributes or, or the X-Array, uh, nice or pretty print. Okay, so we like that. Um, we are now going to uh, define a slice, a spatial slice, um, that is, uh, what, 10 degrees by 15, 15 degrees by 15 degrees. It's in the uh, tropical um, and subtropical North Atlantic. And um, we'll use the cell or selection method that pass it as a spatial slice, a latitude and longitude bounding box, um, and then we'll apply a mask from the mask that comes with the um, um, that data set directly. You don't have to apply a mask, but it's helpful. And it's still not going to download the data. You're just defining what, um, I think it's not, oh, no, I, I think it's not actually downloading the data just yet. Um, okay, what happened there? Oh, I see. Um, so I looked at the file size again, and it's now only 54 megabytes. We can deal with that, and it's not going to take too long. So now we apply the load um, method. And what is going on, I should backtrack here, that uh, oh, maybe not. Anyways, so basically we'll load the data. I guess it was loaded already. Uh, and now we'll just take a quick plot. Um, and as Felipe showed, X-Array gives you the uh, convenient plot command. So without, without thinking about how you want to plot it, uh, we get a nice and very understandable plot of uh, that one time step. You can see uh, Dominican Republic and uh, uh, Haiti and Puerto Rico of SST. It's in Kelvin because that's the unit it was in, but maybe you, Kelvin is intuitive to you. Um, okay, so we'll, um, that's SST from one data set, but you know, never trust a single data set unless you've examined it before. So we'll look at a second data set, SSD data set. Um, and we'll follow the same steps to query um, the Podak for a different data set. In this case, the keyword is Ostia. Um, I have no clue, as shell. I have no clue what that data set is. Um, oops, jeez. Sorry, not my computer. Um, so we're doing the same thing, the same set of steps that we did before. 
exactly the same we get from the on the results on the search on that ostia uh, keyword we get a number of granules um you don't have to look at them um and then we um pick one of those in this case i guess i wasn't uh, i forgot to be specific about that out of the 15 urls that we got back last time which would have been 15 different times that i picked one the first one which is september 1st in this case, I'm actually picking the second one. For some reason here, the second one is September 1st. So to match them up, I pick the second one um, and issue the X-Array open data set, pass the same bounding box um, selection, and uh, I'm going to see how big it is. It's only 1.5 um, megabyte, meg megabytes, and that's because the resolution of this data set is coarser than the other one. Okay, so let's... Downloaded. It's loaded now. It's in memory, and I will plot do the same kind of plot. Well, not quite the same. I decided to try to get a little fancy with Cartopi. I'm not sure I succeeded, but um, well, he can tell me all you need to know about Cartopi. Um, okay, now we'll we've got data sets that are at different resolutions. They're on the same time step. Uh, if we want to compare them, we need to pre-process them so that they are on the same grid. And that's what we'll be doing. We'll do interpolation using the interp-like um, or spatial interpolation so that we can actually compare them. And again, this is not specific to remote sensing. You, you probably, this is something you want to do for any kind of data set. Um, and here we just um, confirm visually that we are, the two are on the same uh, grid after doing this. We can look at what, the uh, data set over or array looks like. Um, yeah, I should have removed that. Ignore that part. And now we'll calculate a difference just to see how the two data sets differ um, on that single time set. So it's just a subtraction to get a new variable called diff. And of course, what we want to do next is plot them using subplots. Okay, now we've got something helpful and useful. Um, the first one, I guess they should have labeled them. The first one is NUR, uh, the second one is Ostia. It, the two are already on the same uh, spatial grid. Um, because of that, we can do the difference. And we use a different um, color map to highlight differences. Red is um, positive differences. In other words, uh, more is higher, if I remember correctly. So that's already pretty useful. We got two data sets of SST from a query um, to Podak, um, where we passed limited information. We had no idea what the granule number is uh, or code. We passed these simple keywords uh, and time ranges, and eventually we got to something pretty darn useful. Uh, now we'll just do a bit of more exploration of the data. Um, so we'll take the data we already have here in memory and um, keep exploring. Here we have histograms of the two data sets to see if there were substantial differences. And they're kind of similar, pretty similar. But uh, if you want to um, look more closely at the differences, here's a histogram of the differences. That looks pretty kind of normal distribution. There'd be a slight um, lag here. But anyways, you can examine that as much as you want. Um, As you saw, we got a number of granules back, or NASA thinks in terms of granules, and a granule is an FCDF file. Um, we only examine one, one at a time, using uh, X-Array open data set. If you actually want to bring in multiple uh, granules at the same time, uh, X-Array has this cool um, ability to open multiple files that are logically uh, part of one set, it's called open MF data set, multi-file data set. So we'll use another example of um, loading that entire list of URLs um, into a data set. But we'll be more careful not to try to download a ton of data. So we just set up the, um, do the open data, MF data set um, statement, which again, doesn't download data. It just brings in the, the metadata from all granules uh, brought, brought together, but not the data, so it's fast. And you can see here that um, the, um, 
date ranges beginning on 301 to 315 because it brought together those 15 files of granules. Okay, uh, because we know we're not dealing with potentially a ton of data, we'll define a much smaller spatial bounding box. We'll focus essentially on the temporal dimension and focus on a small uh, spatial bounding box. Uh, define a new slice and in kind of one step, we'll also do uh, taking advantage of X array functionality. Uh, here we define the bounding box. Um, and here we we'll define a mean, a spatial mean, uh, which will be applied on every time step. So that again, we can focus on the uh, a temporal view, sort of a time series view. Um, and I'm curious how big this is and it's pretty tiny. Okay, now we can load the data. It, it is tiny, but it still takes a bit of time because it's, I assume it's going out and querying 15 different files and different data sets and doing the extractions. Um, and then we'll just plot the two time series together for that small bounding box, the, uh, the mean over those small, that one by one degree uh, bounding box. Oh, there it is. Okay. And there's a plot. And you can see, um, oh, and, and at, by this point, I was getting tired of looking at things in Um So this is in Celsius. And I also tweaked the, um, the Y label so that, uh, you know, we can see it's in Celsius. So this is kind of interesting. But for one by one degree bounding box, we've got differences of only one or a half degree. Which are, it's not trivial. It's not huge, but it's not trivial. Um, well, you could do more things. For example, it probably would have been interesting to put a line there um, on the date that we used for the first part of the exercise, the one time set. Um, but feel free to do that yourself. Um, I'll just uh, have one more notebook, and that'll be the end, and it'll be much faster. Uh, so that was NASA. NASA is a fantastic source of data, not the only one in the world, but a fantastic source of data. Um, I, because we work with values, I know we know there are other uh, sources of remote sensing data, even just within the US, and we're barely touching uh, European um, sources of data. And one of those is also an EarthApp. Um, now, EarthApp is software, so different groups start deploying EarthApp for their own data, like Argo. Um, you wouldn't find, hopefully, remote sensing data on the Argo EarthApp. Um, but they can do that if they want. There is the, the mother load of that though, is uh, based at NOAA Coastwatch, which is where the original developer of that resides. And that's an EarthDep instance that is massive and has lots of things you might find useful. Um, so we'll do something very similar to this, but uh, querying that EarthDep, the NOAA Coastwatch EarthDep. Okay, so load our, our packages. Um, and let's just open it for a second. And then Felipe will have to help me. Um, okay, so this is what Erdap looks like. One thing, um, no one would claim that Erdap is pretty, by the way, I wouldn't. Um, it's pretty good. <laughs> so you can see here, there's a list of 1,452 data sets available here. Uh, that's pretty much impossible to browse manually. Uh, but we will. I am interested now in chlorophyll, and I'm interested specifically in the Veers um, sensor. Why? Because it's a NOAA-managed sensor. So I figure a physical oceanography NASA entity probably doesn't have this. Who knows? Um, so I want to look for a Veers sensor. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but I'm typing. Let's see. I got it. Um, I'm going to type chlorophyll. Uh, if I can type while holding the microphone. <laughs> oh, sure. So you can see that, and that, that is one of the nice features of that too, that you can do, even though it's 1,400 data sets, you can still do a quick query. Um, and you still get a big list. There are 46 matching data sets. And one thing that uh, I noticed, um, I'll grab this. When going over this, um, let's see. some are flagged as experimental, and a few others are flagged as. Uh, 
take that to face down because it should take a point. Okay. Yeah. Oh, darn. Uh, and if you are flagged as deprecated, I don't want to mess with something that's too experimental um, or that's deprecated. Um, so um, I think I spent. I don't use Max. I, I also don't like Max. Um, can you bring the screen back to? There we go. Okay. Um, there is, um, if you look at this help, it is help in RDAP is typically rich, not always straightforward. But um, what you can find in there is there is a way to say, give me the result of everything that has beers, chlorophyll, and that doesn't have this word. So I'm going to exclude, I'm going to exclude deprecated and experimental. And that's just using a dash. Um, deprecated and experimental. Okay. So now we're down to 34 data sets that are canonical, I guess. None of this um, bleeding edge or too old. Um, so after looking at this, I decided that I wanted to Look at where did it go? I forget. Uh, this is a, a, a European product that brings together multiple sensors to provide a merged chlorophyll product, and I'm not fighting it. But and then one of those sensors is VIRS. Oh, it's at the bottom. That's why I couldn't find it. So it is. I believe I picked the eight-day ESA CCI ocean color product. So I'm assuming, though I haven't checked this, that. Uh, this is not a data set that the Kodak would have because it's not in their mission. Um, okay, again, heard that interface is not necessarily pretty, um, but uh, you can download data from here directly, um, but it also provides the URLs. So I, because it's just not my computer, um, uh, the URL becomes the endpoint for open that. Now I'm going to go to uh, uh, back to the notebook, and I already have this here, but you can do a copy and paste. So that URL becomes my open that URL that I'll pass into um, XRA. Okay. And again, lazy loading. It's only pulling in metadata, um, and we can look at that. And you can see that it goes from uh, 1997 through mid 2018, and it's got a ton of variables. Um, okay, now things get interesting here. Back to sort of the real world, opened up is fantastic. Uh, conventions are fantastic, but I found out kind of the hard way that uh, uh, there are quirks in here. One is not really a quirk that. Uh, um, with X-Array, uh, uh, when you pass a slice, you define the names in, in, in the product example. We pass, we define the slice based on latitude being called lat and longitude, longitude being called lawn. Those were the dimension names in the NetCDF files behind this. So you have to examine the, um, the data set description before you um, can decide which variable names you pass to that selection slice. As it turns out, um, for this data set, the dimensions are called latitude and longitude, um, not Latin long. Neither of those is better than the other, they're just different. So if you try to copy and paste code from the other, it won't work just because of the subtlety. Uh, here's where potentially standards could help uh, because there is a way in CF convention to um, define the, this variable, regardless of what you're calling it, uh, it is latitude. Uh, but the interaction of X-Array with OpenDAP doesn't support that at, um, at this time. Um, anyway, so we got that, and um, we have to use a different latitude and longitude than our name. And then uh, as I was playing with this, I also uh, realized another challenge, that um, um, in Podak, the slice definition made sense for latitude. It was uh, the low la lower latitude, lower value latitude first, followed by the higher latitude. The lower longitude followed by the um, higher value longitude. As it turns out, um, whoever created this data set, um, I don't know, maybe they live in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, 
but they decided to arrange latitudes in the um, from top to bottom as opposed to bottom to top. So you can see that the order is going from higher latitudes to lower latitude values. Uh, so I learned the hard way in uh, trying to compose this request and to compose this slice that it only worked if we specify this slice for latitude in decreasing order. So instead of 25 degrees to 26, the other way around. So anyways, this is illustrative of the real world. So we'll, once you do that, everything works. And I will issue this um, selection based on this uh, three-year um, time range or daytime range. And we we'll look at the subset again, lazy loading. So this is just metadata. We have um, um, again a one degree by one degree spatial box and 138 time steps. These are eight-day composites, so uh, not daily. And it's 29 megs. Um, for chlorophyll, the chlorophyll, there are many variables here, but the chlorophyll variable alone, it's even less than a megabyte. But it turns out to be a bit slow when you request it. Not, not terrible, but uh, you would imagine it goes like this, but it doesn't. And I, I bet it has something to do with how the data is organized in the back end. Also, one thing to, to um, oh, that was fast. One thing to um, uh, point out here, in contrast to the NASA product, the NASA product organized everything by granules. And these are basically temporal granules. So you had to bring together all these granules, pass it to an open MF data set in order to construct a time series. Here, it's pre-organized um, as a single endpoint, single granule, if you will. So we don't have to mess with that extra step um, that the NASA product um, imposed. Uh, okay, so let's start exploring the data. Here's just a simple plot. Um, again, you see next array plot of the first and last time step. Not sure what I gather from that, except that the uh, variable name is awfully long. Um, so um, I had to cut out the one on this end um, because it was just huge. Okay, so now we'll do the same thing we did last time. We'll do a, a spatial mean and create a time series, except it gets a lot more fun because now we're dealing with three years rather than 15 days. And again, chlorophyll. And look at this interesting thing. This is about March. This too looks pretty similar, which is neat. It's neat that uh, over a one by one degree, um, the seasonal signature is very robust. But it's also neat that we got this real peak, and it's not one time step, it's uh, several. You can see it climbing. So it lasts, I don't know, a couple of weeks, um, which is, again, pretty interesting. We'll zoom in on the plot a little bit. Um, so, Three years of uh, remote sensing time series through ERDAP from a group that in Europe that merged sensors um, to get at the best um, chlorophyll um, uh, product. I added down here, and, but I won't go into it as you're all hungry. Um, and it's uh, reusing some of what we did in the product example uh, to look at SST in that same uh, box to see if there's a pattern in. Um, in temperature that might suggest why that chlorophyll, uh, chlorophyll um, bloom is happening. So basically I copied and pasted all the product pie um, code, compressed it so that it would be um, compact, not pretty, but compact. Um, and again, I won't run it right now. I defined the bounding box, except I had to change the Latin lawn instead of latitude and longitude and 25 to 26 instead of 26 to 25. Um, the start and time and end time are defined as strings in the product pi request, uh, which is unfortunate. It'd be better if they used uh, if they allowed for Python daytimes. Uh, but anyways, all those little things. And request Ostia. Look at what we got. We get 92 granules, which will take more time um, stepping through. And that's where I stopped. Decide your assignment if you wanted to um, uh, continue this. Is use the same steps in the product to come up with the time series plot for SSD. And ta-da. Yeah. Uh, so our next thing would be 130, uh, the cloud computing uh, tutorial. Um, where's Amanda? Have you decided you want here or in the other Okay, cool. So you'll be here.
And Jen, you said something about the lunch. Uh, All right. If you have any questions, a burning questions on remote sensing and all this stuff, well, you can ask now or else we'll all be here. Um, <laughs> <laughs>